G'day all bloods, AOS Coach here, and we are talking all things Seraphon, but very specifically, we are talking the Coalesced, and I'm joined here by the High Oracle of Sotek, Basil Inferera. G'day, welcome. Did I get your name right? You killed it, man. 100% right. I, lo I love the intro. I, you know, I don't know if it's, it might be a little too big for me, but I, I dig it. Nah, you, you absolutely deserve it. You have come from the mean streets of the tough crowd. And we're going to talk about the new Battle Tome. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the Coalesce show. So um, while we might touch on some Starborn here and there, we really want to focus the conversation. So if you are going to play either uh, Coattail's Claw or Thunder Lizards, we will have a very refined discussion for you. Mostly because, Basil, um, correct me if I'm wrong, when I look at the two books, or, sorry, the two parts of the book, the list construction and the value in units and the way you build the list is fundamentally different. And I'm not saying that you can't take Saurus in a Starborn list. You can't take Skinks over the other side, but there is very much a build focus and a, a way to best leverage the rules. Definitely. I, I think almost even more so than the last book, they've really pulled Coalesced and Starborn apart so that there is some very very distinctive benefits of being you know when you're going to build a coalesce list what units benefit from that versus when you're going to build a star Wars list what units benefit from that so yeah it's it's almost like two books at one really yeah which is awesome and i even felt um if we go down to the coalesce even more i felt the separation between thunder lizards and Kotel claw was even more separated than it was in the old book definitely yeah i mean i i think that was one of the things that definitely jumped out to me about this book is they've really you know for, for better or worse they really seem to lean in pretty heavy on kind of like giving everything these really distinctive silos um and i i enjoy it just because I, I think it's one of those things that lets you get a lot of kind of flexibility out of a book you know you can play coalesced for six months and get tired of it and switch over to starborn and it's like you're playing a brand new book it feels so different. And um, what's really exciting as well is you got a whole bunch of units. So um, Basil and I are going to talk about not just the rules. We will share some of his list constructions. Um, it is early days, folks. So if you're listening to this, um, there's no FAQ or errata. So their things might change down the track. But just know that this is our, our early thinking and our thoughts about the Battle Tome. And I guess how are we going to try to make the most of it in the current season? So um, that's what today's focus is going to be about. It's not the be all and end all. It's not to say that this list is the one you take to your tournament. But hopefully it kind of gives you a few ideas of how to put the the ideas and the units together to make the most of the rules. But Basil, what got you into Seraphon? Because you've been playing it for a while now. And, and actually, I tried to get you onto the show about six to 12 months ago. And you must have known from the um, the constellations that a new book was coming. And you, 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 you just spent me into reality. But like, talk to me about Seraphon. What got you into it and what keeps you playing? Um, yeah, I, I knew I could sense that this was coming and we just had to, you know, we had to wait for the perfect moment. Um, I would, <laughs> I would love to pretend like this is some, you know, complex answer about the play style and stuff, but it's dinosaurs, you know, um, when I very, very first saw Warhammer for the first time when I was really young, it was someone Seraphon army lizardman in fantasy. Um, and you know, I was like this big and i was just like dinosaurs that's awesome and then when i finally ended up getting into it it was you know you're choosing between humans or elves or dinosaurs so it was a it was a pretty easy choice for me and then um the play style just kind of grew on me i really started to appreciate the fact that um it's an army that does a lot in it can work in a lot of different phases uh it has things that can do you know do magic do shooting do melee um it felt like you know there's a ton of scrolls in 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 to work with too so it just really um kind of started to vibe with me from a play style perspective too so it's kind of become the only army that you know i really keep turning back to uh again and again so it's hard to say no to dinosaurs 
it's so hard to say to know the dinosaurs. <laughs> I um my my very first game of Warhammer was actually uh, staying with my friend and he had the Bretonia versus Lizardman box and he wanted to play Bretonia. I got to play with the Skinks, the uh the Saurus Warriors, the cardboard Croxigore, I think it was, and um I absolutely loved it. And um it's always been one of the armies that I always enjoyed and um, I'm so happy that they have two sides of the fence, right? I, I I kind of hated a little bit back in first edition Age of Sigma when it's all like demons, uh, celestial demons, and I'm like, where are the jungle lizards? Give me the jungle dinosaurs, and I'm glad we have both now. Yeah, definitely. I, I think everyone. It was such a, a big kind of change coming out of uh, the end times into like, oh, now they're space demons that you know have all these summoning roles and stuff like that so that was kind of like a weird pill to swallow for a little while but i think um as soon as they they had the book that kind of gave it that split gave it a little bit more definition um it kind of they came kind of came into their own a little bit more in age of sigmar which i, I really appreciated being I, I tend to lean a little bit more to the saurus to the coalesce side of stuff anyway so it kind of vibed with me a little bit more so now that you've had the Seraphon book for a couple of weeks now, what is, what's your what's your first impressions between the last version of the book and the current one? Um, have you found that it's it's uh, an improvement? Is it a fundamental difference? Like the whole play style has changed. Um, has it gotten stronger? Has it gotten weaker? Like again, what's your what's your overall first impressions? Um, so I, I think. The answer to a lot of those questions is, is yes. Um, I think that the book right now, that the new book is stronger than the old book is right now. I think that when the old book came out, um, it came out kind of like right in the pandemic. So I don't know if you weren't playing T a lot of TTS, you may have not gotten the full brunt of 80 point salamanders and fangs of sotak when it when it came out right at the end of two like that was an, an oppressive book um an oppressive list from just a raw damage output standpoint um it doesn't really have that anymore um it's not especially if we're talking coalesced so like the coalesced lists that were that were super popular that like you know Gavin and Talon that those guys were winning a ton with. Um, it was you had, you know, Thunder Lizard, you were running Bastilodons with solar engines, or you were running the, you know, Arca so Sotek. It was like a very generally shooting forward book for 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 the most part. Um, I know there was kind of like a, a little heyday where that croak three Arca Sotek list was was doing the rounds, but um, for the most part, I would say it was a shooting forward book. I would not say that's the case anymore. Um, it feels a lot more well-rounded. It feels like things like Source Warriors and stuff that's supposed to play in Melee ha has a lot more play, um, which, is, which is a good thing. I, I think that's a good thing um, because that type of play style that was really popular in, in the last book, you know, I, I think no one people want to fight you know people want, want to punch you on on objectives um getting shot across the table by a bastilodon that's shooting 18 times or whatever it is was like not quite the same as as you know fighting with source warriors on objectives so uh definitely different i think it's better right now like i said but not as good as the book was i, I don't think this book will have the the peak that the old book had which again is is probably a good thing the old book was pretty was pretty pushed a lot of the time um but yeah i i, I think it's good I, I really i backing up a little bit i really like the new book I, I think it has um a lot more kind of play across the entire range versus a handful of scrolls that are gonna show up in a lot of lists you know what i mean 
I think that's the nail on the head there, right? Um, in in the previous book, there were specific units that you would always see in play, whether it was trying to maximize those cold one riders just to get as many bites as possible, whether it is, as you said, like double Bastilladon or, you know, Arcs of Totex and, you know, even like going back to first edition where we had like Lord Croak on a Bailwind Vortex doing a bunch of mortal wounds. Mm -hmm. Like there's these, and like, I remember the the Salamander coming in, burninating all the peasants. There's been these little builds over time and there always will be, but I do feel like for the first time in a long time, Croxagore are finally useful. You know, you can build some decent Saurus warriors and get good value out of them. You've obviously got these new Agridon riders, which I think bring a different kind of build. And I know there are some people who are actually quite excited about running these Agridon style with a Carnosaur and things like that. And mm -hmm. there's obviously monstrous rampages. And I feel like the, the, the Carnosaur has definitely got a better glow up than it has. And even the Troglodon feels like it's got a little bit more useful than just being the Slan's little 2IC. There's actually some more things to do with it. So you know, I felt that the book was more balanced and I think it's got more diversity in list building. Definitely. I, I, I completely agree. And I think a lot of that stuff in the old book, if you saw it, it was like a lot of things in the old book were so cheap that, you know, they're like, you could bring a, a Carnosaur, a Scarvet Carnosaur, it was 200 points. So it was like, you could shove that into a list and kind of not, and still have a lot of the same, same benefits of, you know, the Bastilladons and the shooting and everything, the slam casting, everything else you wanted, and you could just also have a Carnosaur because the whole book was so cheap. I think now there's less of like, eh, it's 200 points, you can throw it in there. Or like, eh, you know, this thing is, you know, so cheap, we can just throw it in there until like the last couple balance updates where they, they hit the book pretty hard. But for a long time, you know, everything was just so cheap. You could kind of do whatever you wanted a, a little bit and there were these pieces that didn't really matter now things feel a lot more uh purposeful like if you're going to use the troglodon for example there are reasons to use the you know it's spell it's aura um if you're going to put a carnosaur in it's you know got things that you want it's not just cheap it has ren 2 it has the the terror for no inspiring presence you know it it does things rather than just is a cheap body which is Great. The Carnosaur used to be so underwhelming. Like whenever I saw it, I just put a couple of wounds on it and then I'd ignore it almost for the rest of the game. Now it feels like an absolute threat on the table, which I love. Definitely. Um those old those old brackets were were pretty rough on the on the Seraphon uh, monsters. I think it was like two two wounds taken and it already bracketed. I think like three to four was its second bracket, which mm -hmm. was ridiculous. But it, but it stems more than that. Like I remember looking at Saurus warriors versus skinks and there was almost no difference. Like there were one wound idiots. One had a little bit better of a save. One obviously did mortal wounds from the blowpipes with some synergies, but like there was, it was so hard to justify taking Saurus, but now they are different. And I think that's probably the thing I enjoyed the most. There's a lot of little glow ups that make it, as you said, more meaningful choices in your list. Definitely. And that was my always my biggest problem um, running source in the last book is that you could do it and and there were so many kind of like free buffs that, that you could make stuff work if, if you really wanted to. But at the end of the day, you would just feel like I could replace this entire unit with, you know, almost like one and a half as many times skinks and it would be better in every way. It's faster. It does the same damage, more damage except at range, it has access to more buffs. Um, and what am I sacrificing? I'm sacrificing, you know, a little bit of melee damage and a, a single, uh, you know, plus to save. Like, but yeah, now Saurus feel chunky. They they feel like they they have that kind of space to play in the book where you're, when you're list building and you're going like, okay, well, I need something to sit on a point. You're not going. Oh, should I bring Skinks or should I bring Saurus? You're you're looking at Saurus. You're looking at Skinks for you know they're still really mobile screens. They you know still have some some fun speed tricks with the the you roll two dice when you run or redeploy and pick the highest one. So like yeah, it just kind of goes back to like things feel a little more like I'm picking this for this reason and that feels good rather than just kind of like 
I have a ton of buffs I can give to anything. Why don't I give it to the best unit in the book, Skinks? Yeah, yeah. And Skinks was just the backbone of Seraphon for such a long time. It was Skink, Skink, Skink. So I'm glad that Soros have stepped up. But we've alluded to a few units that probably have had a bit of a glow up in the in the current book. Are there any particular units that you're now a fan of? Ones that maybe you weren't using in the old book that you're now reconsidering? Like, because I, I, there was a lot of good changes. Definitely. Um, the the big one for me is anyone on, on my club in my Discord knows because I talk about it all the time. So in the first Seraphon book, I ran um, – a list that was 90 Soros Warriors in a, it was like one of those weird one drop battalions in the old books. I don't remember where you could like bundle a bunch of battalions together. And then for whatever reason, it became like a one drop. So I did that because I like Soros Warriors. I was relatively new to, to Age of Sigmar and then 2.0 hit. I've always been kind of on this, like, I want to play, I want to play my warriors again. I want to play my warriors again. So that that is the one unit i would say um got the most impactful glow up for me personally just because i have a ton of old painted warriors i love using them and they feel good now really good i, I think they're um one of the few scrolls in the book that just has very obvious kind of efficiencies, if that makes sense. Like you can look at blood warriors, for example, the scroll and then the point cost and go like, that feels good. It's just like, it's an obvious point efficiency. I think Soros warriors have a little bit of that. And the best part about that is I think they're good in the way that makes sense for them. They seem tough. They seem like they fight and they grind well, like, that just is the vibe they have, and that's what they do now. They're really tough. They kind of have this, when I've used them in games, they sort of just like sit there and they just like chunk, 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 chunk. And it, it feels very kind of thematic about what I want. So that's my uh, <laughs> that's my exclamation point in the book in terms of like something they got a glow up that I was a big fan of was, was the Warriors. And, you know, if I had to pick another one, it would, it would probably be the Carnosaur just because kind of like we talked about earlier, it got um, some pretty, I would say, pretty small additions to its scroll, but they all felt impactful. It got an extra rend on everything, and it got a couple extra abilities with the Terror for no inspiring presence or like the one thing it does, you know, Maim and Terror for the Scarvet or the whatever the Old Blood one is called that lets them give two command points. Those feel, feel really impactful, and it, it makes the... On top of the extra wounds, it makes the the Carnosaurs again feel pretty good. Um, I know a lot of Seraphon fans wanted like a, a Stonehorn or a Maw Crusher esque type of Carnosaur model, but they've that would be that would have been a very cool design space. They've never really gone there for um, Lizardmen armies for whatever reason. The monsters have always been a little bit more. You know, they're going to be in the 250 to 350 point range, not that like 450 point. Yeah. <laughs> For whatever reason, they've never been there. Like they keep denying Games Workshop keep den denying me. I want Carnosaurs and Steggies without mounts. Like get that old blood off my Carnosaur and give me a feral. Give me oh, feral yeah. dinosaurs. Just make me make bravery tests if I have to, but just let me have feral monsters. Feral Carnosaurs was my was my pie in the sky wish for this book, and they did not give it to me. So next time, next may, time. May, maybe in Dawnbringers, maybe yeah, hopefully. Dawnbringers. Hopefully, on the coalesce side, I'll tell you one of my favorite changes, and I'm being a bit cheeky here. Okay, the monsters feel more like monsters. They got extra wounds, so your Bastilodon, your Troglodon, mm. your Carnosaurs, all your Steggy varieties, all got extra wounds. And we already talked about it slightly was um, the brackets, you know, no longer do they bracket so quickly. Like I'm looking at the Scarvet on Carnosaur. It now brackets at after six wounds, which is basically, I'm pretty sure it used to be like one to two wounds was like bracket one, two to three to four. Like it just bracketed so quickly and the damage just, just a couple of shots, a couple of magic spells and this thing's fighting at half strength. Now, yeah. You're getting so much value. And as you said as well, like the terror, love the terror rule. Yeah. 
Me too. Uh, I mean, I, I I watched, I think it was on Warhammer Weekly or whatever. They were saying that they're kind of just giving it to everything now, which is uh, the deny inspiring presence, which is kind of true. But also at the same time, like I am glad that <laughs> if everyone's getting it, that Seraphon also got it. Um, and yeah, I c- couldn't agree more with the brackets. It was one of the biggest problems with the monsters. And especially because the things that bracketed were always like, you know, it's pretty impactful stuff. It's not like, oh, it's move goes down and, you know, one thing hits worse. It's like, it was like the damage on one thing, the wound on another thing, and its movement goes down. So it's just like you were getting slammed at every every bracket. Um, so yeah, that that feels a lot better, especially with the wound increase. You know, a lot a lot of them went up even more so than they like built the thunder lizard plus two wounds into every profile. And then they also like a lot of them got a little, a little extra love too, which is, which is really cool. The, the other cool rule, and I know we're jumping ahead a little, little bit here is I love the update to the bite rules. Um, Getting the plus one attack on a whole bunch of like average at best attacks. Now being able to do mortal wounds just feels like it's going to be faster and it's more like the ogre attack where it's just more effective. Like, yes, I know that, you know, at the end of the combat phase, if coherency doesn't play in and you're not within one inch and blah, 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 blah. But in, in my, in, I, I get it. Don't at me about particular situations. But I just feel like as a rule, it is much more effective and strong than the old version. Now, am, totally. I, am, I, just, am I crazy? No, I, I I don't I don't think you are at all. Actually, when I when I first looked at the book, kind of one of the things I started to get attracted to on Coalesce that I was like, which is why, you know, my personal list building involves a lot of Soros warriors because, like I said, I like them, but also because I, I think bites is the thing that helps that unit. You know, there's like there's a lot of like 32 millimeter infantry sort of in that band. They're like three up saves. They have a couple attacks that are threes, threes, rend one, one damage. But then the source warriors have bites, which is like it's and when we talk a little bit later about kind of like the army strengths, this is one of them. Like it's that consistent sustained damage every turn. If they're if they're pulling models out, like you said, like that's still a plus because there's there's a trade off, right? When you pull models out of the beginning, you might not get as many models in when you pile in. But yeah, it's consistent sustained damage from the mortal wounds. And the realm ship replacement is a little awkward now. But if you can get 20 warriors as your kind of like anvil in the range of the realm shaper where you're doing the bites on fours, it it it, it goes, man. It it churns pr- pretty good. And um it's some of the most fun I've I've had in the book where you're just like Oh, combat phase is over. Let me roll one, two, three. You know, blah, blah. I'm going to have like 10 bites on fours, five mortal wounds to do in addition to any damage you did. Like, yes, please. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. It makes me feel like not if I was, if I had a list that could like turn one charge you or get into your face really quickly, I almost feel like I don't want to. I want you to move up and get out of that realm shaper a- area because mm-hmm. I don't want you doing mortals on fours. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and it's it's kind of a, an interesting uh, dichotomy, too, between um, whether you kind of lean in. Agrodons don't have the bite rule, which is something that a lot of people are kind of weird about. But it does let you have this kind of like dual role where like the Agrodons can pressure and the warriors can can sit at home. And they both do that job really well because, you know, as we'll get into the Agrodons have a rule that kind of they want to pressure. They want to be in combat. They want to be kind of like pushing the pace. And then the source with the bites, they they want to sit at home. They want to be by the realm shaper. They want to be on, in your territory on your objective. And like, that's super cool. The only um, thing I would say about the bite rule is that it it's a bummer for the monsters because none of the monsters obviously got that that rule and then you know so like stegodons don't get an extra bite carnus don't get, they were the ones that were benefiting a lot from the previous yeah. rule and now they don't get it at all so it's it's a little bit of a switch there but in it's it's a switch i'm fine making because i want to play source warriors and i think the monsters at least the carnosaurs got enough of a glow up that you don't miss it as much i would say no, I was disappointed when I noticed, like, because I used to run a couple of Stegadons in my Thunder Lizards, mm-hmm. and when I saw it wasn't on the monsters, I'm like, oh, I'm a little bit sad, um, yeah. I, I must admit. 
but it wasn't all like positive. Oh, is, by the way, is there any other any other things you'd call out as like a positive that you've noticed that you really enjoy, maybe underappreciated previously? Now it's like this is awesome. Um, so I would say I in in my list building, I've debated pretty heavily actually uh, recently, like whether you need a slan in coalesced which is not uh which in the last book was not really a conversation you were ever seriously having with yourself um that might turn out to be totally totally wrong but right now i'm like you know there there is a a very croak is good and he does his croak things but like there's there's pretty compelling kind of advantages to just being like you know what instead of a little bit of extra magic support and obviously the magic defense is great but like i can just have more bodies that are that are good now like the scrolls themselves are just better and you still get scaly skin so it's just like more stuff sitting on points um and especially in this ghb that feels kind of it feels right because like a lot of plans are a lot more central there's not really any uh, plans that use six or eight where you're like spreading out so like you know it's very much this sort of like we're gonna brawl over a couple and like bodies that are tough and sit on points will help that yeah it's actually funny because um i did get a bunch of questions from discord and one of them from ivory the bravery Bra bravery bomb said how badly am i limiting myself if i don't take a slan and it's interesting because um the slan is good but where I was going to go in a second was there's a bunch of things that have gone against you as well. And one of them being the, the Slan lost Comet's call off the war scroll. So it's in the Starborn spell law, but not in the coalesce star law, spell mm -hmm. law. So when you're taking this, the, 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 the coalesced Slan, what a mouthful. I know. Um, <laughs> you, you, you're not, get, you're not quite getting the same Slan that the Starborn's getting. So, are you limiting yourself if you don't take a slan? Um, so I would say you are not you're not limiting how well you can do. I would say you're limiting the strengths of your list in some ways and amplifying it in others, which could be the right choice a lot of the time. Um, because I think magic especially is like very polarizing, especially right now. Like you have armies like corn where or like if obr is playing no myriad right where it's like just like magic is a liability just like straight up live and even lumineth with teclas who's going to reflect mortals back he like damaging magic is a liability so that's croak croak does a lot of damaging magic he's the the slon that's doing that um you can and i have used croak into corn and and you rely a lot on kind of like those support spells as well i think the coalesce spell legions is still pretty good uh for slant but you start to feel like okay like in starborn a slant just sort of casting spells is giving you so many benefits right he's giving you summoning points they're acting as nodes to kind of like have a lot of those extra effects in coalesce he's just supporting your blocks you know he's giving them extra rend he's that that teleport spell is is really cool um but he, he's doing that he's supporting your blocks and there's kind of like the age-old adage right of like boys before toys so like you have your blocks and you can support them but a slan is 275 points and then croak is almost 400 so like yeah. that's a that's a lot more stuff um i think that's a long that's a long way of saying like I think playing without a slant and coalesced right now feels totally, completely viable. I could be completely wrong about that. I think a lot of it probably depends on the meta and what kind of armies you're going to be playing on a regular basis. But I think the stuff, those scrolls in coalesced are good enough that you could just have more of them and you're not losing a ton. I think the biggest thing you lose in coalesced is the magic defense. It's the ability to more reliably unbind those important spells from armies that don't just like power stuff through so like armies that are going to cast eight times you're kind of still like okay i have three unbinds i'll get three spells but whatever you'll get the other five off or if they're casting on like plus four with thankful you're like okay well <laughs> i guess i'll throw a dice at this but whatever 
so you're you know like if feck <laughs> is trying to cast you know their their plus attacks or whatever you'll ruin their day for sure but i don't know if you need to ruin feck's day to then have a, a piece that is not necessarily doing 275 points worth of awesome stuff into the armies in the game right now that are at the top of the heap for lack of a better term so i, I think it's totally viable so what I'm hearing from you is it's yes and a no. I guess it depends on what you could also do with those 300 points, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, like, yes, the meta, you, you might want those spells that can be really powerful, but also it could just be a wasted 300-point support piece that could have been better off increasing troops, giving yourself better heroes or monsters, giving yourself some other things. So... You're not, you're not as crazy as you might feel, but also you you might find it's a good meta choice. Um, that, 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 that's that's one example of something that's gone backwards. Um, has, there, has there been units that maybe you've picked in the past that now not as attractive? And the Engine of the Gods is one that I'm going to pause you on just because I've got the new War Scroll up that I'll bring up later because that seems to be a bane of people's existence. It changed, and it changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And it seems like most people are not a fan of the new Engine of the Gods, so I'll pause that one on, and get your proper thoughts in due time. But outside of the Engine, um, is there any other units that you're like, eh? Uh, definitely. So I have, I think, uh, some pretty obvious choices and then one that, that might be, I don't want to say super controversial, but maybe not as obvious. Uh, I think the Stegodons, unfortunately, um, not just the engine, but just the regular Stegodons, they got the least impressive glow up, I would say. They still are kind of exactly the same from a profile standpoint. They got a couple extra wounds like everything did. Got an awesome monstrous action, which can't be understated in Colast. It's good. The fight lasts. It, it, that is good. Um, counts as 10 on an objective. Also really good. I just don't know if the the stuff, the wounds, the damage it's doing is worth 300 points, even if it does count on 10, and even if it is making stuff fight last. Like At some point, you do need things in the army to like not just stand around. Um, and, and I think Steganons are, <laughs> they're a hard sell right now. I don't think they're as bad as, as kind of um, it's being portrayed, but I think they're, they're definitely more of a hard sell now. And then the, the controversial choice to make is, is I think Croc score should, could be way better. Um, I think when you compare and comparing across books is, is always, is never going to make someone happy. You're never kind of setting yourself up su for success when you start to compare across books, but Croc score fill a very similar role to like trolls or Theranons from Slaves or something like that. And I just feel like Croc scores, they need to be pushed a little bit either in damage or defense to really make them feel awesome. Um, if they still moved eight, I, I think that would also be something, but they move five now. Mm. The damage is good not amazing and they're four wounds each so it's 12 wounds on a four up so it's like they're not insanely wound efficient they're not insanely damage efficient and their movement went down um i don't think they're unusable i don't think they're they're so bad that you'll never see them i think that they could have been better so they could hit on threes i think and not have any change in points and people would be like, oh, that's like, cool. I'm bringing Croc scores. I feel good about that. Whereas now every time I have them in a list, I'm kind of like, I kind of just want to find 25 points and put in 10 more warriors. That might just be me, but um, that that's kind of where I'm at with, with Croc scores, unfortunately. I wonder if Croxigores are not for you. And I say that because like maybe they're meant to be the starborn unit because one of the things that stand out to me is the um, the skink guidance where they get to receive commands if they're within 12 inches of a skink. Now, that's not a unit that you would traditionally have in a uh, coalesced list. So I wonder if it's meant to be the hammer um, to the skink anvil. And I, I don't know because... Like, when I look at that, like, yeah, cool, you get some bites, and that obviously plays nicely with the coalesced rules. But outside of that, like, you've got Agridons, you've got Carnosaurs, you've got Saurus Warriors, like, you've got so many other good options. I just don't know if Croxicles are meant to be for coalesced in a 
super synergistic way, folks. I'm not saying you can't play them. I'm just saying that the rules are not not really doubling down on coalesce. Um, I, I don't I don't think you're necessarily wrong with any of that. I think that just kind of goes back to maybe a little bit one of my kind of dis- is that they have the, one, the bite attacks they have are actually pretty good. But like you said, like the rest of the rules. So it's like they have the bite attacks with synergize and coalesce really nicely. And they actually have the, the best bite attacks out of all of them because they're getting three each. You're, you don't have to worry as much about kind of like getting as many in range as you do with the Warriors. Um, but almost all the other rules on their scroll have to do with like being near and around skinks, whether you're talking about the croc- the war spawn or the regular ones. You know, they have the war spawn even more so with their other rule where they get the ridiculous rule where they get an extra attack, like if a whole unit dies or something. Um, so it, it, there's a little bit of, you know, do they, they, feels like they work with skinks and stuff in Star Wars, but then at the same time, like it does feel like a pretty decent part of their scroll is dedicated to these bites. So I'm sure, I'm sure someone will find a way to, to use them effectively just because, you know, Ren's two is good a lot of the time and uh, the, they, they, they do do decent damage. So I'm sure someone will find a way to utilize that. Um, well, I just, yeah, I think they are, they have some cool rules, thematic, I would say, to like the old, you know, Scroxagor units from from Lizardmen times. But um, it does seem like that does hold them back a little bit as well, kind of being of this this two minds uh, on the scroll. They just feel like to me that they're meant to be the second wave. Like you got your skinks in your screen, and then the Croxagor following along. Mm-hmm. They they're not movement eight, so they're not meant to catch up. They're meant to be the second wave. The skinks retreat, they run away, and then you you smash them in the face with Croxagor. While with your list, your movement is so fast. When you look at again your Agrodons and other units, that you know these don't keep pace. So, but I I, I would agree with you. Like they're not like super crazy good. But this, they're good, but yeah. they're in a weird, like, where, I, I would, where do they yeah. sit in the list? I, I would say that 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 sentiment is a sentiment I have across a lot of the book, where it's like, they're good. They're good. This is a, a good scroll in a good book that will perform goodly. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not going to it's not going to be, you know, the the list that people run to the to the forums to to complain about but it and then you know it's also not going to be the the scroll that no one ever brings ever because it's you know slangor level bad it's like it's good hey hey sl- slangor decent now they oh, are they? okay so, <laughs> slangor in the old book then they, they, they can fight twice now <laughs> well, before i bring up the rules i do want to ask you about the uh the graveyard um, now you lost eight mm. war scrolls. Some were just superseded with a new version of it, right? You know, you lost your cold one riders or I can't remember what they were called. I think were they called cold ones? They like, source yeah. knights, they were called. Source knights, yeah. <laughs> Mate, I'm old, I'm OG. Like I remember the derpy <laughs> yep. uh Soros Knights. Um, you know, you lost obviously your Razordons, you lost your Salamanders. Yes, you did get the um some new troops, but have you felt the pain of any of those eight units disappearing? Um, so I would say, surprisingly, the, the Source Knight uh, pain is one I didn't think I would care as much about. But as I'm building lists, I kind of I kind of do. Um, I don't know how they would have gotten a glow up. I, like, they may have not served the same role. But, like, having a 110-point cav unit that could screen and had scaly skin was was something that like i'm like ooh, like that would be nice to put in this list right now where i like i don't want to spend 200 points on saurus spending 85 on skinks is like they don't have scaly skin they you know it's it's not quite the same like having this like because they they were a screen that could kill other screens they had a lot of attacks and coalesced that could you know none of it had any rend but like you know you could put that into a screen and, and blow up a screen and then it would be so th- that that is that is something I miss more than I thought I would. Um, and then I miss uh, salamanders for a, p- a purely selfish reason that I have a ton of them, and I am sad that I have so many of them. And I painted them up, and I like I like them. And and the new model is so cool that I'm just like 
I think I'm just going to have to get the new model. So the new model is cool. By the way, um, I am laughing at you because I've just played an RTT this week, literally today. Mm. And um, one of the screening units I had was the Cities of Sigma version of them. I was using Drake's Sworn Knights, yep. 110 points, three up armor save, 10 wounds. Uh, I'm like, this is so good. Like, it's yep. so good. So, like, I, I can appreciate where you're coming from. Like, I, I truly appreciate because they were they were my MVPs. They they soaked up a thousand points of shooting attacks from um from KO and they just died. Thousand oh. points, three boats, all the all the little idiots in the boat. So I can appreciate that. And then like my formanators went in and smashed them in the face. Nice. Yeah, and that's you know. 10 skinks is never going to do that right so no, no. it is uh it is something i i do miss a little bit more than i i thought i would and i also have 30 of them so it's like i'm like what am i going to do with all this stuff now Re rebase them come to join me in the old world um, <laughs> <laughs> so all right let, let's talk the rules and let's talk a little bit about how you're looking at this as a competitive really good player um so we're going to pause on the constellations for a second. The coattails, claws, and the thunder lizard rules are coming up, so we'll just pause on that one until we get the rules up. But as a as a experienced player, um, I'd love to know: Do you like the rule? Is it something you build around? Is it something that's just there and you take advantage when the situation requires? How do you look at these different rules? So, let's start at predatory fighters. You get the plus one to your bite rolls for your coalescorus croxigors. Um, for those various bites, is this something that you build around and just try to put as many um, Saurus in your list? Um, like, how do you look at that rule? Um, so that that was. Let me try and and actually say something that feels intelligent. Um, <laughs> pred predatory fire is, I think, good to have. I don't know if it's something you specifically build around, but it also. With that said. It is something that I think allows a Saurus-based list to have that extra punch that it may be missing, and that feels really good. So when I started building lists, I like Saurus Warriors, so I kind of latched onto them. But then as I started thinking about it a little bit more, it's kind of like, okay, these bites, you can, and because I'm a psycho, I sit around and I roll dice all the time. And so, like, 10 dice from Source Warriors, like, I'll, I, like, rolled that through, like, a ton of times. Like, hitting on, or, like, doing damage on fives. And, like, you are are super, super content. on like, I know averages. You don't need to roll the dice. But, like, sometimes that, there's, like, something about that, you know, that, like, feels a little there's, bit better. There's, there's something with the, the rolling of the dice. I, yeah, I like, get it. It's, it's much more satisfying than clicking, you know, stathammer.com. Right. And you, like, you want to feel it. You want to, like, okay, I can see the averages, but, like, how does this actually work in real life? And it's, like, you know, you will you will spike that sometimes it will if it spikes low it's like okay whatever if that spikes high it's like it's a big deal you do six seven mortal wounds after you fought that's a big deal um and that's on top of you know doing a a, a ton of just like kind of you know okay rend one or, or rend two depending on the thing that's fighting attacks so that's a, that's a long way of saying like i don't know if it's something you specifically build around but i i do think it's a rule that allows you to be like heavy on saurus and and you might look at that list and you might go okay like where is that extra punch it's a lot of rend one attacks like how, how are you cracking things like a protector block or something like that and it's like oh well actually predatory fighters is going to help you do that you're going you're going to kill a protector after you fight every time just from bite attacks um and that i think is something that that is that is really impactful and i think it is the thing that kind of starts to pull those source based 32 millimeter infantry style guys away from all you know the blood warriors and the chaos warriors and like all the other samey same like this dude has three up save and two attacks that are three threes run run one damage like there's a ton of units like that in the game predator fighters is what makes saurus kind of i feel like you know have that little bit of step up when it comes to at least the damage the grind they're, they're gonna fight those units and they're gonna grind a little bit higher higher because they all have the same attacks and then saurus are also doing and i like it better than um gulping bites too just because Gulping bites on fours is like, 
it feels a little too like okay and then i do nothing right it's like i roll a couple four ups i do nothing so like it it has bigger spikes bigger swings this feels like it has a tighter band of damage it's doing it so you can like rely on it a little bit more you can go into a unit or, or have a unit fight and you're like all right i know kind of how much damage my attacks are going to do and then like i can rely on that you know two to four mortal wounds from bites Whereas with the ogres, you're like, hey, you know, I might do nothing. I might do 12 mortal wounds, who knows, <laughs> or whatever it is. So for anyone who doesn't know this rule, um, look at your source guard, for example. Like, look at your source warrior. Um, you'll see the rule on the war scroll. This just then adds one to the roll. So, for example, the source guard, um, or the source warrior, sorry, um, at the end of your combat, so after you've fought, um, you pick a unit, one unit within one inch of them, and you roll a number of dice equal to the number of models within one inch. So... If your opponent is smart, they could pull back and get out of combat or get out of one, which I know is one of the gripes of people. It's a, I think I think some players want like a crystal touch from the snakes where they can just bounce wounds much further away. Um, but anyway, like regardless, the rule is on a six up. So even if you're in starboard, you get it. It's just that in coalesced, you get plus one to this roll. So you'd be doing mortals on fives. Yeah, and I think the the point you made about pulling out of combat is is uh, is a big one. I think depending on on how they FAQ that, um, if they FAQ it to just always be after removal, it does hurt, especially um, with things like Source Warriors, where like you you're already kind of maybe struggling a little more than like three Crocs core to get them all in. But kind of like I mentioned a little bit earlier, like there can be advantages to forcing someone to remove that front rank versus removing the back rank like most of the time people are you know they want to maximize their frontage because that's where the objective is that they want to be on you know so like if they're pulling or or that's you know how they do more damage if they're pulling that front rank then they're also not piling in around you to get more guys in or piling in around you to get more guys on the point so like it it, it is a downside for sure for sure. I, I don't want to say it's like all roses. It is definitely a downside, but I do think that there is advantages you can get from someone playing it that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Like people could be putting their champions and their special weapons and, you know, they'll either have to keep them there or they'll get bitten. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, but I can appreciate why some players would be upset with the way it's worded. Like I totally get it. Definitely. Um, the, the other big rule before you get to your monstrous rampages is the um, the subtract one from damage inflicted um, for each successful attack that targets coalesced when it's Saurus, Croxigore, or Monster. So if you were to put in the Slan, you put yourself some Skinks, you put in something else, um, they would not benefit. This is very consistent to the old rules. Um, but do you build around scaly skin? Like, do you, again, in a coalesce list, do you just only put in Saurus, Croxagore, and monsters and maximize that scaly skin? Um, th so this rule, I think, is like, this is the, the defining feature of coalesce, right? This is what everyone, you know, hates the most. Everyone was hoping that this was going to go away. But this this is definitely the, the rule that you build around, and I think it's what makes adding things in, like... You know, skink units or the slan um, you mentioned. E e e yeah, even the slan like it gives you a little bit more pause. Um, I think it's hugely, hugely it, the impact of this rule cannot be understated. I think it's definitely why it's been so polarizing, and I think that's part of it is it, it does make coalesced pretty polarized. Starborn, which I'm sure you guys you'll talk about in your Starborn show, like Starborn also polarizing, but in completely different ways. It's like, you know, can can you stop magic? Then Starborn's gonna have a bad time. This is like, do you do a ton of mortal wounds or or one damage attacks? Well, <laughs> coalesced it doesn't have the advantage it has. Are you ogre gluttons then sorry like it just sucks to fight coalesced well, well for, for, for example like uh, as a gargant player it's very frustrating to go in with my damage three or my damage two attacks and they go down to one because I, mm -hmm. I have less attacks now so you're right like when i play with my gloom spite with more my one damage idiots it's a volume game and i don't care less about the scaly skin 
But when I have high value, high damage attacks that are less, every every hit counts, every wound counts, and then you're subtracting um, one damage from each attack, which sucks. Yeah, it's for, it's for me, so impactful. for me, not for you, <laughs> not for you, but for me. Yeah, it's it is it is so impactful, and I think it is part of the reason why you do start to think about, like I said earlier, like do you do you not take a slant? Are you just all bodies on the board? Because it becomes a very hard list to remove from the table now because most lists that are doing volume attacks, like you said, they don't do uh, the volume that it would take to remove 150 wounds on a three up save or, or whatever it is either. A lot of stuff that is, you know, a lot of those really high damage things they're they're multi-damage You're, they're doing multi-damage that is how you get the you know marathi goes in with mind razor and kills 30 things you know like she's doing that with high damage attacks she's not doing it with 30 damage one attacks. so like it, it becomes very impactful it becomes something i think you absolutely build around and i think it it does start to shape the way the army plays in the meta a lot just because like we said earlier like the 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 pieces of this book go this way this is way over here and if the meta doesn't like scaly skin then you're going to do a lot better than if the meta doesn't care about scaly skin yeah maybe the last comment i'll make is um it obviously doesn't affect mortal wounds so right. um it does mean you're more susceptible to mortal wounds mm -hmm. um but regular damage um anyone who's fought like the cruel gas cruciator and that bubble this is a whole army of it like, yeah. like yeah. it's just a bubble like this yep. is everybody and it works in in ranged which is which is awesome yes. it, it's yes. all damage melee ranged you don't need any bubbles you don't need to, it's it's such a good rule i i don't know how else to to kind of exaggerate um how no, good this good. is it's good. Like, like if you, if you don't understand how good it is, go play a game and just tell your opponent reduce the damage by one and just see how it's more survivable, <laughs> um, less damage. Uh, if you apply wards or if you um, like, there's just so much. It's it's like getting a whole bunch of extra wounds in your army. But anyway, I'll I think talk. we talk too much. We talk too much about scaly skin. What I want to talk about, and I'm very excited about being a monster bro is the four new monstrous rampages that coalesced monsters have not starborn coalesced so there's one for each of the key monsters so your uh carnosaur your stegodon your bastilodon and your troglodon keyword monsters um will so you stick it on obviously you could do engine of the gods your carnosaur is your two different versions of the um the carnosaurs but um, they all have a different monstrous rampage that you can choose instead of um, the universals like Titanic, Jewel, Raw, Stomp, blah, blah, blah. What, what What's your thoughts? Do you like these? Are you taking a monster because you want to access bludgeoning sweep from a Bastilodon? Like, are, are any of these so strong that you actually want to take a monster just for it? Um are you finding you're taking these over like Titanic, Jewel, and Roar and Stomp, who are all very good monstrous rampages? Um, so I think to to answer the like, I don't, I don't, I don't think you take the monsters for these. I think they're they're kind of more of a nice to have. I think unfortunately, you know, there's no Stonehorn flying monstrous rampage level of goodness here. Um, but I, I do think they're all nice to have. And, and it does when we get to the list and we talk about Thunder Lizard. I think the combination of some of this stuff, especially in Thunder Lizard, where you can use two monstrous actions that can't be the same, but you can use two, starts to be very cool. Um, I think the Bastilodon one actually is is really is really quite, quite good. I mean, they're all, I would say, actually, they're all good. They're all good. The Bastilodon one specifically is, I think, maybe a little bit better than the, than the other uh, three, just because when you have... The Ark of Sotek now. The Ark of Sotek is cheap. It doesn't bracket. It goes into a unit of 10, you know, schmoes on an objective. Between uh, Bludgeoning Sweep and then its, its regular attacks, you're just doing like six-ish mortal wounds. Like you're just, your damage is 75% just mortals, which is something that is really good now that seemingly everything in the game is, is pretty tough um i i've enjoyed that quite a bit and then 
I think we, we talked a little bit like the Stegadon one is good. It's just, you know, a four up. I, I understand why it's on a four up, but like anytime you have a 50, 50 chance of something happening, it's, you know, can be a little womp womp. Uh, on, the on, on one resource. I just want to call that really quickly. You, you traditionally get one monstrous rampage per monster. So do you take raw stomp Titanic jewel smash to rubble or a 50, 50 shot at a strike last? Right. I think it's it's usually probably something you're doing in addition, right? Like if you have multiple monsters and you're probably roaring first and then doing this, which is kind of like it goes back to like you're probably roar is probably your first choice in a lot of scenarios, but in in some scenarios, which is why I like bludgeoning sweep, because like a lot of the times the th things you're putting that Arcosotec into, you're not you're doing mortal wounds anyway, so like you don't care about roar. Roar, be all out of defense, I don't care. So you get more opportunities to use a bludgeoning sweep, if that makes sense. Um, and then odious roar is cool, just because it's it's kind of like the one you can do not in combat. So like you could just be standing out in the middle of nowhere, and you can you can roll the the odious roar roll and just get your range a little bit more. So it's kind of like you can just sort of start to rely on like a twelve inch range on his minus one to hit versus a nine. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, I don't think it's something you build your list around. They're just all kind of nice to have. Uh, I will say, and we didn't quite call this out, so I, I do want to mention it quickly, is I thought the Bastilladon uh, Arc of Sotek got an improvement. So mm -hmm. you almost you almost never saw the... So uh, the Arc of Sotek is all the snakes, right? The uh, solar engine is the, the big blast, the oh, Blastoid yeah. blast. I don't think I've played a Arc of Sotek since first edition. Um, it's always been the, the, the solar engine. The Arc of Sotek got a glow up and it complements this bludgeoning sweep quite nicely because it wants to be in combat. It wants to be closer and the damage output from the snakes is much more consistent. And um, I actually liked it. Yeah, I know. I, I agree with everything you said. I like it a lot. I mean, when the Arc of Sotek was showing up before, it was like, it's so, ch it's 165 points on a two up save. Like people were bringing it as a screen more so than like anything to like screen out croak and engines and stuff like that. Um, but now I think it, it actually feels like it has more of a role in lists than maybe even the solar engine does now, because like you said, it, it, it wants to be in combat. It has a little bit more of a consistent kind of curve to its damage um, with the mortals and having bludgeoning access to bludgeoning sweep is just kind of the, the, the cherry on top. We also didn't mention that uh, the Bastilladon lost its one plus armor save. So I did mention it obviously in my preview video, but um, I imagine that is going to mean that it is not not less durable, but um, you are going to need, if you want to try to keep it around a lot longer, you're going to have to use Mystic Shield. You're going to have to find uh, all that defense because the one up save made it almost invulnerable for the first couple of like, attacks unless your opponent was hitting you with mortals mm -hmm. yeah uh so it it's kind of so it doesn't have the one up anymore but it has a two up through its entire wound profile which it which is cool so it kind of got a, a little bit less upfront durability for a little bit more back end durability but the book itself lost the skink priest obviously which means you lose sunstone staff which gave the the plus the run charge and the plus one save so like it did lose a little bit of ac extra access to the plus one save so you know you used to be able to have a basilidon on a one up with plus two or three to save and you're just like yeah you're you're have fun you know you're you're never going to kill this whereas now um you're not necessarily you're you know you might be on a two <laughs> you might only be on a two up with with, <laughs> with plus two to save but you know it it, it definitely did uh did change a little bit there it's it's a better op opponent experience because some of them didn't have range mortals and it's the most frustrating experience. Oh, yeah. So you'll have a better time with your opponent. Yes, you're not going to get your one up save, but consider it charity to your opponent. <laughs> consider it a charitable task. You know, Seraphon players always so charitable to their opponents. <laughs> it's uh, it's all a part of the great plan. Exactly. Um, is there anything else you'd mention about these particular monstrous rampages? Like, obviously, they're situational, and uh, you don't have to use them. You can use the universal ones. Um, 
I, I think there's some really interesting ones. Um, I can't wait to hear about someone using the Carnosaur's gargantuan jaws to just eat a five wound hero mm -hmm. idiot. Just like, just straight up roll that six and just like eat it. Like it's like Jurassic Park. Dennis Nedry, see you later. <laughs> um, oh no, he, he, got, he got no, he got he got done by the Velociraptors. Yeah. Um, but like like otherwise like they're cool but i think you're right it's uh, it's great to have more tools like i think ultimately because like you know yeah. you'll have a bunch of monsters and you'll you'll come down to smash to rubble and you're like i, I can't use this exactly uh, i th i think you kind of hit the nail on the head it's like it's tools to have occasionally gargantuan jaws is going to be the choice over roar and you're going to be glad to have it um because it's stomp isn't going to do anything i think like you'll be glad to have it um you're playing Chaos Warriors and they put their banner bearer too close to you, chomp. You don't get your neural banner, your eroding icon anymore. Like that, that is always going to be good. But yeah, I, I think you're you're definitely right that it's you know, it's more tools in the toolbox. It's not necessarily uh, why you're bringing a list you're bringing or why you're playing coalesced. What what rules did you lose? Did you have mount traits and um, another rule? I'm trying. I'm trying to think of what it was. So coalesced had the uh, whatever the rule was that gave them mystical on all terrain that was in their territory. Yes. Which which is it, that was huge. Obviously that that was a, a huge rule. Um, so losing that was not the most fun, but it also is like. It was it was kind of janky, um, and then they also lost mount, the mount traits. The mount traits that White Dwarf gave them. It was just one for each of the. So like Starborn had one mount trait, Coles had one mount trait. There's no mount traits in this new book, which I think is is a uh, something that will always confuse the 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 Seraphon faithful a little bit. Is that we have all these mounted dinosaurs and and have pretty much always had no mount traits but uh it does seem like for whatever reason um gw seems to be moving away from them in general so yeah like like soul blight lost them as well mm -hmm. like you'd imagine um vampire lords on zombie dragons would have a mount trait they're gone as well so yes you lost them but know that you're not the only people and maybe they're removed maybe they're removing that from like most factions so yeah it, it, it definitely seems that way so that would uh i mean that would make sense all right, so now we've got our command traits. Assuming that you've told me everything um, on, on the surface for the allegiance level, let's get in a little deeper and say, right, I'm building a list, and um, I, I had a couple of questions that come up, so I'm just going to clarify here, folks. Okay. Um, there are no there are no skink command traits, um, so you can give yourself a skink general if you want, but you'd be using the universal one. So if you're in Starborn, there is no Saurus command traits um this is kind of what we talked earlier about trying to split the two right there, there's a feel so absolutely um coalesced has your slan slash uh saurus general abilities and um, do you like any of them do you like many of them like what what, what are your go-to ones um yeah um i i like many of them um i don't think you're going to take a slant general and coalesce very often, but I think if you do, Master of the Material Plane stands out just because it it and it gives you access to. There's basically two spells that you want in the lore. You want Empowered Celestite for the extra rend, and you want Telepathic Summons. Um, even if they do FAQ it, I still think that ability is is really strong, and it means that you can take a regular slant and you don't have to uh, you don't have to take a spell enhancement. Even with that said, I, I think you're going to take a slan general very, very rarely. All the Saurus command traits, in my opinion, are good. Vengeful Defender is the obvious standout. Um, it lets you do things that the list would otherwise struggle a lot to do. So and I'm sure we'll talk about spells in a second. There's a spell that combined with Vengeful Defender gives you a ton of first turn reach. And then when we look at my list, you'll see you can use that on units to pin pretty effectively to be very uh, aggressive if you want to um which just goes back to kind of like tools in the toolbox right like <clears throat> this is an army that excels standing on points it excels being defensive but having vengeful defender gives you this kind of pre-turn movement to apply pressure if you need to or to just kind of like be a little bit more flexible in terms of how you're moving from like kind of like your deployment your screens your stuff and then you can very quickly be like okay i'm gonna like 
get my stuff onto points without having to deploy so spread out, or I'm going to shift my army very quickly from the middle to the to to a, a kind of a more like rightward flank because this is the the side that's weak for my opponent's deployment or whatever it is. So vengeful defender an obvious standout, I think. Um, and then I like. Uh, Prime War Beast. If I was going to like rank them, I would go Prime War Beast because I think in when we look at my the list I, I sent, I think you can combine Prime War Beast with a Carnosaur General and the Blade of Realities to create a Carnosaur that feels like those, you know, 400, 500 point monsters that we were talking about that it's not because it, you know, it has an extra attack on all its mounts. It's getting an extra rend from the Blade of Realities. It's potentially doing an extra damage if you're fighting a hero. Like, it starts to do a lot of damage very fast. Um, and I think you can uh, target other other heroes and other monsters um, really well with that. And, and I think the combination of, you know, like, doing more damage to them and then scaly skin, because they're usually, you know, a monster hero is not usually like, oh, I have 27 one damage attacks. It's like, I have five damage, three attacks. So Scaly Skin really hits that. So it gives you a monster that can fight other monsters. Uh, actually, I think really nicely, which is a lot of fun. And then Thickly Scaled Hide is like, I would say just, it's just good. You you could put that on, on a Source General and like, I don't think you're going to be <laughs> upset that, you're, that your General is tougher. I just think the other options give you more specific tools that you can apply in a game versus this kind of like just sort of like passive i'm going to save a little bit better uh kind of buff while i mostly agree with you i don't mind dominating mind so yep. um i, I okay. tend to agree with you in regards to the saurus general but if you do if you did decide to take a slan I don't know. I just, I'm somebody who uses the plus one to wound triumph and that's a once per game ability. And I, it's something that I value a lot. Um, being able to do that every turn on a two plus, I, I, yes, there's obviously the chance to fail, but a two up is a pretty good dice roll. Like it's very likelihood to hit. I don't know. I, 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 I do like that. But I also see yeah. the fact that if you do have multiple, if you have a slant that have multiple casts, knowing extra spells is going to be helpful. So I, I do appreciate that. No, yeah, I, I think, you know, plus plus one wound is always good. I, I, I totally agree. I think I think you could take Dominating Mind, and, and especially if you're taking, um, if the monsters, you if you had, do have some Stegodons in, in your list uh, that aren't getting access to the Kotal's Claw plus one wound, I, I think then it, it starts to maybe look even more attractive because you can get those Stegadon profiles back to kind of like the twos twos space that, you know, starts to do a little bit more reliable damage, even if they are on rend one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think either one is going to be a good option um, depending on what you're building around. But, Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I think there's some good options. I'm not really drawn to the first two slime ones, to be honest, like, okay, like two artifacts. Okay. So what? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it kind of is like two artifacts. It's like it's good because it gives you two extra, and then you still get the free one. But it, um, you're still just putting a bunch of artifacts on, on your salon. And there's one good artifact for the salon, but like I don't know if you want both of them and then your regular one. And then wrath. I mean, plus one attack is again always good. It's just the range is pretty small once per game it's once per battle that's yeah. the killer the it, the fact that it's once per battle is a killer compared to mm -hmm. the ones that i can use every turn absolutely absolutely so yeah like dominating mine once per turn wrath of eons once per battle like mm -hmm. eh, no thanks speaking speaking of those artifacts you have plenty so you've got seven artifacts to choose from um what are your favorites? If I'm taking a Slan, obviously, obviously, I'm going to have a Saurus in my coalesced army, so that's a given. Um, but if I was taking a Slan, whether it's my general or not, um, are there any that you like? Definitely. Um, I think it, it's a Grubs is good. Uh, it's was good in the last book. It's good in this book. It especially if you're you know Crow can't take artifacts, obviously. So the Slan has a little bit more of a defensive role just because it all of its spells are, are either support or defensive so you're probably bringing it in your list for the magic defense 
less than like I'm bringing Crow because he just you know poops out a ton of damage. So Ixie Grubs makes that magic defense a, a lot more reliable because a lot of the time you're really trying to unbind one spell, and it would be nice to unbind a bunch, but it's like it's that one spell, the spell portal, or the you know the plus D three attacks or like whatever it is. Like there's one spell you really want to unbind, and having a reroll on that um, has always. I mean, I played this entire last book pretty much with uh arcane might which is just you know it's the same thing basically but it, it's a command trait so or or i played with with itsy grubs if my command trait was prime Warby. so i still think that's great um and honestly i probably wouldn't touch any of the other ones i think throne of the lost gods is fun it makes the slant a little bit more of a beefcake, which is, is always fun. You know, Codal Famili Familiar, again, is like, it's pretty fun, but uh, he's a three-cast wizard already, so like, do you want to be a four-cast wizard on one turn? Maybe. It's it's just like, I think you're you're either looking at Itsy Grubs or you're looking at even, um, you know, Universals, the GC artifacts, before you're looking at these other three, really. A thousand percent, yeah. The, the Grubs is the only one I would take from the slant, to be honest. Otherwise, I'd rather get either more Saurus artifacts, go get like Vala the Manticore, go get something else outside, mm -hmm. make make a non-wizard, a wizard with Arcane Tome. But yeah, grub, Grubs or grubs or nothing from the slant. Agreed, man. What about the Saurus? Um, so I think this is a little bit like the command traits, but less they're all good and more like i think there's there's two big standouts and blood rage pendant again is like it's fine I, I think you could put blood rage pendant on something and you're not like super upset about it but you are just taking an inferior choice i think so Tex gaze is great for um stuff that you know is not necessarily going to be fighting so like if i'm bringing a list that's like croak astralith bear skink wizard saurus you know, anvils, and then maybe an Akron unit or two to like pressure. I'm and and my general is the Astralith Bear. I'm putting Sotex Gaze on him. He's not going to get a ton of use out of Blade of Realities. He can sit behind my Source Anvil and make you hold less while I just grind away at you. It, it kind of fits that Source Warrior grindy style a little bit. But then, kind of like I mentioned, you can pair Blade Realities with, um, Prime War Beast to make a Carnosaur that's that's pretty chompy, uh, especially into other heroes because it gets that extra damage. And I think, you know, anytime anytime you're taking uh, a weapon from Ren One damage two to Ren Two damage three, like that's potentially a big deal. Uh, and they have five attacks on the Rider, so like I, I think Blade of Realities is good if you um, kind of want someone that's a little bit more fighty and you don't necessarily need the. The wounds holding um i think you could take either one of those and be thrilled <laughs> i think i think when i was looking at these artifacts i had my thunder lizard hat on probably not as much as my coattails hat and i remember looking at sotex gaze and going okay it's all right it might be my like my second or my third artifact because mm -hmm. i'm thinking about it as like carnosaur old blood like i'm thinking that right but or even like we see your, your scar vet on agridon but when you then, as you said, make it more of a defensive play with an Astrolith bearer, I, 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 that resonates with me. I'm like, yep, cool. I see the value in that. Would I put it on an offensive piece? Mm, maybe the Agridon guy, maybe a Scarvet on Agridon, but certainly not on my Carnosaur. Certainly yeah. not on my Carnosaur. I agree. Um, and you, you can you can make you you can put him on a Carnosaur, and he becomes kind of a fun piece where he can you know run in this uh, a unit of 10 on an objective somewhere kill a couple of them and if you whiffs you're still holding that point so like there's something cool there but i i would probably lean blade of realities if i was putting an artifact on a carnosaur just because you know killing stuff is fun man but what, what i would say to what you just said is that with terror then if I kill a couple of those, um, those one, two anyways, wounds, right? correct. That was kind of why I didn't value it as much, but yes, on a defensive piece, especially like a coattails list. Yep. I'm, I'm sold. I, I like, I like it. Um, and I think blade realities to you, blade of realities. Yeah. Plus one rend is just too good. And plus one damage. If it's a targeting a hero, that's where a carnosaur wants to go. They don't mm -hmm. want to be going into like your chaff. It helps. But you want to fight it. You want to fight a monster. You want to fight a hero, and this just complements it so well. Definitely. 
it's Definitely. certainly how how i would want to do it anyway yeah um spells so you've got a bunch of spells so again so maybe maybe actually i'll loop here first you've said that you know do i take a slant yeah no like obviously there's there's pros and cons on either side when you look at this spell law and there's five spells for a slan, um, and there's obviously three for skink, so there is a reward for taking some skink wizards, so there are no native um, Saurus uh, wizards. Is these spells enough for you to take a slan? So I think there are some really strong support spells. I just... It, it, it goes back to, like, I don't know if there's any spell that's so strong that you're like, it, it, Comet's Call. I need comments call on my list, you know. I don't know if there's that spell. I think empowered celestite and telepathic summons are are the standouts. I think uh what is it? It it sees invigoration is also fine. Drain magic again is, is fine. I know there's like the weirdness right now where like it actually doesn't do anything for dispelling rolls, but just stopping or reducing their unbinding rolls is good too. That yeah, that 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 needs to change because the order of activation is you have you can't dispel because dispel happens at the start. So you, you it, it that's a weird interaction that needs to be clarified or fixed up. Yeah, definitely. Um, so assuming they 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 do fix that that spell again, it like it has a little bit of value. They're not they're not without value. I just don't know if it's enough value, especially um on the slan who you're picking one spell right. So you're always picking empowered celestite. Pretty much, I would say, unless unless you just are taking a list with with no source, which I would probably say is not going to happen in Coalesce, but you never know. Um, unless so it, you, it, un unless unless you took the um, the Slan as the general, get t plus two spells, yep. then add Ixie Grubs to get the reroll of in, uh, a cast a spell mm -hmm. a dispel and an unbind. Yeah, it, it it you can kind of create this little package that, that feels very uh good from a support magic piece. I think you know it's like, oh, do I want to give up Vengeful Defender? Do I want to give up the Blade of Realities of my Carnosaur? Like there, there's a choice to be had there. Um I think Empowered Celestite is just obviously the the best one and it's it's really good. Everything has a pretty decent range. You know, nothing is is cast on like uh nine or ten or whatever. So like pretty much getting everything off. I mean the Earth Trembles is is got the highest cast and I don't I've casted that like twice I think in all my games and it's done like one moral wound. So probably not gonna be in my my spell repertoire but um yeah I would say you're probably casting empowered celestite. Is it worth bringing a slan for? Probably, but I could see not doing it as well. As someone who tries to cast Mind Razor and probably fails more than they succeed, um, if I'm going for like the Earth Trembles, and the Earth Trembles is not Mind Razor, it's no. not Mind Razor. Um, but if it was, I'd have to then add Cogs as well. So then you're doing you're doing a slant mm -hmm. with Cogs, and like, no, it's that's not worth it. But no. empowered cel celestite, absolutely drain magic. Depending on how it's FAQ'd, possibly that could be quite powerful, especially with Lumineth, Zinch, and some of the other magic that you might be facing. Um, I tend to agree, though. Like if I'm going into a slan, I feel like I'm probably going all in. As I mentioned, having the general making it the Ixy Grubs, probably going Warlord or some type of way to get an extra artifact mm -hmm. to to get the reality sword. Um, I wouldn't want to just have one artifact in this list because you're right. I think giving away that sword is just too valuable. Um, but I also like the grubs. Yeah, I, I, you know, I largely, and I think one of the nice advantages of Croak is he knows the whole lore. So, like, I played a game with into Corn where, you know, his, his deliverance is is just a detriment, <laughs> um, especially when your opponent rolls rolls hot on his uh, his spell ignores. And there, I I never found like there were wasted spell slots. I guess I should say like I I found ways to use all four of his cast, and it felt impactful. It felt like I don't know if it was four hundred points impactful, but it, it felt like I wasn't just like oh well this is a complete dead weight because he can't do his, his damage that he's supposed to do. Um, it would have been nice if the earth, the one damage spell, the earth trembles was a little bit more oomphy. If that makes sense, it, it would, you know, losing comments call, losing the damage from the realm shaper coalesce has almost no ways to do range mortal wounds. Now um, it would have been nice if, if that one damage spell was something that you actually thought about, 
putting on a wizard ever. Yeah, yeah. You, you do feel the damage of not having Comet's Call. And yes, good call out. Croak does know the entire spell law. So when Croak is in a Starborn, he knows the Starborn slant spells. If he's in Coalesced, he knows this Coalesced. So even Croak will not get you access to Comet's Call. Um, so that's that's not a that's not a, a, a hack at all. So don't try it. <laughs> what about your skink wizards? Would you? Because we we haven't talked a lot about skinks. Um, would you bring a skink wizard? And there's only one skink. Well, sorry, no, that, that that's technically not true. I was there's there's a skink in the chair. I was going to say that you lost um the priest, the priest. Yes, yep. you lost the priest. Um, there is no priest in Seraphine now, which is a, a big departure. Uh, going from engine who's in every list and priest who is in every list to now no priests. Uh, that's a big change. Do you like any of these spells? And in, is it worth bringing a skink priest or two into a coalesce list? Uh, I think absolutely. I, I think the, the skink wizards, uh, not only do they have great war scroll spells, um, both of them have great war scroll spells. They both have great abilities as well. The, the skink lore is, in my opinion, if, if you're going to pick one, you have one slot for a wizard, which you know you don't have to, but let's say you do. Uh, you're picking a skink wizard. I think Heavenly Frenzy, Run and Charge, is is obviously huge. It can go on any Seraphon unit too, which is awesome. It's not um, Vengeful Defender can only move Source and Croxigor. Heavenly Defend, uh, Heavenly Frenzy can be on any Source unit, which is awesome. So you can give like your Arcasotech Run and Charge all of a sudden. And it can, you know, have a of a little bit more zip than maybe someone is someone is expecting. Um, I think this is kind of this combined with Vengeful Defender gives you a very impactful first turn range. Um, whether you're bringing warriors or Agrodons or or even Croxigors, you know, Agrodons are going to move eight at the top of the hero phase. They're going to be in range still to get your Star Priest buffs, to get your Mystic Shield, to get your Heavenly Frenzy. Then they're going to run, you know, six maybe. So they're going to move another 14. So you're moving 22 now. And then they're going to charge and be in your face with scaly skin buffed up, you know. And and that that's something that potent is, is a lever that you can pull without really sacrificing too much. It's not a specific way you need to build your list. It's like you need to have buffing heroes you're going to have anyways. You need to have the heroes or the, the units you're going to have anyways. And you can have this really impactful first turn push um, if if you need it, if the the, the matchup demands it. Uh, I think light of Chotic. Ch yeah. <laughs> you pronounce I, I, that? I, I, I pronounce that Chotek. Chotek. Um, okay. Light of Chotek. Um, I think that is way better than Celestial Hypotheosis, which was uh, Apotheosis, which was the, the heal spell that got value in the last book. So especially in if you're um, running kind of maybe a more Thunder Lizard, more monster heavy stuff, you have a Carnosaur with it's taken nine wounds. You spike that that roll. He he is healing a ton potentially, which is awesome. And then I think Titus Serpents, now that they've increased the range to to 15, um, it's it's good. It's really good, obviously. It's it's a it's a horde killer. Uh, it's potentially something that the book might you know, struggle with if, if you're facing 120 zombies or something like that, it, it gives you uh, kind of keep going. It gives you a tool in the toolbox, right. That, that you otherwise wouldn't need. I'm probably picking heavenly frenzy and yeah. only picking tide of serpents. If I don't have a good target for, for the, for the heal spell. Agreed. I would go heavenly frenzy, light of Chotek, then tide of serpents. I like light of Chotek because it means I don't have to use heroic recovery and mm -hmm. um, the coalesced heroes have gotten a uh, reduced bravery. Like their bravery is not as good as Starborn. And even then Starborn's not that great. Um, like it's decent, but it, it lost its bravery ten shenanigans. Um, so being able to like reliably heal, not have to worry about a um, Emerald Life Swarm. I can heal in combat. Um, I just like, I, I like the light a lot. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I think, you know, it obviously just gets better the better targets you have for it, right? So, uh, yeah. I, I definitely agree. Um, and it means obviously, um, yeah, it means you, you can fight at your best bracket more often. Mm -hmm. All right, 
let's let's look at the the left hand side. You got your your two sub factions. Um, Coattail's claw being really focused on the Saurus and the Croxigor units, uh, getting the plus one to your wound rolls um, in melee. Uh, as long as they charge, as long as they charge. And then Thunder Lizards, with the um, at the end of the charge phase, you can carry out two monstrous rampages. So you could use your special one that you just got in addition to Royal Stomp, Titanic Jewel, Smash to Rubble. I want, I want, to, talk, I want to talk Thunder Lizards first because it's probably the simplest and easiest one. A lot of people seem disappointed with Thunder Lizards. And when I look at this, I'm, I maybe tend to agree, like, I get two monstrous rampages. Like that's okay, I guess. I I don't think that you're wrong uh, uh, at all. Um, I do think there are some interesting things that you can do with two monstrous rampages. Um, that I think are. It's not you know I'm not going to say it's the best sub allegiance ability in the world, but I think there are interesting things you can do that make it feel impactful. So the Arcosotech we talked about, it goes in, it does its bludgeoning stomp, it's doing D6 mortals. Then you're doing stomp, you're doing D3 mortals, then it's fighting, it's doing another three to four mortals. So like that unit starts to very, very quickly do a ton of damage to things that it's getting the full D6 mortals against with its bludgeoning, uh, its bludgeoning uh, tail or whatever to sweep. Um, that That's a cool interaction. I like too that it lets you kind of in like that Assassin's Carnosaur build we're talking about, it lets you go into another monster, roar and Titanic duel. Mm. So you you... It, it kind of further increases that like I'm good against you. You're really not great against me. I have scaly skin. I'm going to roar you. I'm going to Titanic duel. So even if you do roar me, I still get my, my full benefit. You know, I, I think those things are cool. And then in, to the Stegodon one, it feels less bad kind of throwing that monstrous rampage away. Oh, I didn't roll the four up to fight last. That's fine. I still have my second monstrous rampage to, to, roar stomp or whatever i was going to do so i agree that it, it is a little lackluster especially considering like how pushed the thunder lizard kind of sub legions bonuses were in the last book but i do think it th does give you some some pretty cool opportunities and you know scaly skin um and some of the just the base coalesced uh rules are so strong already i think it's just kind of like it's nice it's nice. Yep, yep. yep. I'm not saying they're bad by by no means, folks. Am yep. I saying that these rules are bad? I think if I was thinking about a sub allegiance, like what what is it that I would want? Like this is cool. I don't know if it's exactly in my mind what I expected. Um, especially I when agree. I look at Kotal's claw and you get plus one to wound on the charge. I'm like, man, that's hot. Imagine I got that with my Carnosaur. I imagine I got that with my Steggy. Imagine I got that with a troglodon. And like, okay, like two monstrous rampages are cool. And you're right. Like, um, cause when I play with my sons of Behemoth, there's some, there's some really cool new monstrous rampage where I can like suplex you on a three plus. And if I fail it, then okay. I'm just sitting there. Who cares? But with some things like my beast smasher, I can do two monstrous rampages. So I'm like, you know what? Even if I fail my three up, I've still got something else that is viable or automatic. So, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I think you've made some really good points. Um, I I think probably one thing is that it's clearly steering you towards monsters. Um, I probably the old second edition Thunder Lizards. I feel like you saw all monsters. It was just all the Steggies, all the Carnosaurs. It was just all monsters. I don't know if that's the list that I would run anymore. I feel like I still want some Agrodons. I'd still want some Saurus. And even though they don't, they might not get the boost through Thunder Lizards. I feel like the pure one hundred percent monsters is probably a, a competitive list. I wouldn't run today. I I agree. Um, I think, and especially it's like to to your point, Thunder Lizard is the monster build. Its bonus is clearly aimed towards monsters. But if you go all monsters, you're still running out very quickly with of monstrous actions, right? Like if you use the battle line stags, even if you have two of them, it's like okay, well. I have, two, I have two stags, a, a hero monster of any kind, and a Bastilodon. Like, two, two monstrous actions starts to feel very, like, whatever, because you have enough monsters to use all the monstrous actions you want anyways. Um, so I, 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 don't think, I don't think you're wrong at all, especially about the kind of the competitive nature of the all-monster list. And it would have definitely been nice if Thunder Lizard's sub-legions was... Uh, something that maybe facilitated that a bit more, you know, like encouraged you to like 
not just bring monsters, but hey, maybe you want to bring all of them. And I think that's what the thun- I think that's what the Thunder Lizard players want. Like most, they just want to run a, a sub faction with all their monsters. Mm-hmm. If you want to run them, run them, folks. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not saying don't do it. Um, I just think I think if I was going to be in- incentivized to run like three Stegodons as my battle line with a Carnosaur, with an Engine of the Gods, with that type of like almost like Sons of Behemoth type of like low model count monster list, mm-hmm. um, I would like a little bit more, but it's cool. Don't get it. I, I like it, but it's probably not probably not the thing that I was expecting. But Kotel's claw, boy oh boy, does this slap. Yeah. Um, I think you know, one of one of the big problems with Kotel's Claw in this most uh recent book that that just just phased out was it was plus one to hit on the charge, which you know, it was like, oh okay, I guess I don't have to all out attack, but there, there's a lot of ways. And there, especially in that book, to give stuff plus one to hit. So sometimes it didn't feel like you were gaining a whole bunch. Plus one to wound is an entirely different story. There, there is not a lot. You know, plus one, best day ever. Like having plus one to wound is always like kind of like the cream of the crop when it comes to like those attack buffs, just because it does seem like a little bit more rare. Uh, so being able to ch- charge in with a unit of Agrodons or Saurus or Crocs or whatever all attack and just get that base plus one wound you're hitting and wounding on twos with a lot of stuff um which starts to make the damage you know they don't have maybe it's not insane ran maybe it's not insane damage numbers but it's very consistent it's a lot of very consistent damage which is again it's just something i think this army does well like it has this kind of like nice sort of like it's always doing what it's doing and before you know it you're like oh wow i've actually I didn't lose an entire unit in one turn, maybe, but like I am taking way more damage than I want every combat phase, and it's starting to stack up. Yeah, plus the bite attacks, plus mm-hmm. there's so many other things. So yeah, yeah, I, I think it's kind of why I look at I look over the fence and I go, "Yep, Kotel Claw is definitely probably the stronger of the two. I I, I would say you're not wrong in that uh, assessment at all. Um, it's definitely the one I'm a little bit more drawn to, and I think I would probably default to Thunder Lizards if. And on, and we'll see kind of that when when we look at the list I, I sent. If I just don't feel like I have the Saurus to benefit from Kotal's Claw, so it's like you know maybe you're taking uh, Croak and you only have like one kind of unit of Saurus Warriors as an anvil. Um, maybe then you start to look at Thunder Lizard instead. But I think most of the time you're you're in the Kotal's Claw space. Uh, just yeah. because, like you said, it it is definitely kind of the more attractive of the two. It's I think it's more useful around the board. Mm-hmm. Um, Realm Saper Engine. So you, we've already mentioned a few things. Um, first off, it's it's uh, no longer garrisonable, so it's impassable. So you can't move on it. You can't protect yourself by going into it. Um, blah 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 blah. You should own passable. If not, read the rules. It's on the screen. But what I want to talk about is the fierce guardian. So. Um, as you mentioned, it no longer does mortal wounds. So I'll let you explain. So what, what's what's changed here? And it is different to the Starborn one. It is. It is def- definitely different to the Starborn one. Um, and it's the biggest change, I think, for Coalesced is losing the Realm Shipper Engine's mortal wounds and mm. the, the Slans mortal wounds. It really cuts back on Coalesced specifically ability to target heroes which is something the seraphon has always been so good at so the new realm shaper for coalesced is com- i would say completely different forget the old realm shaper entirely that's the starborn the old, realm shaper yeah i was gonna say the old the old one is very much what starborn has right yep. it's this is this is a, a rule set we've never seen before yep exactly so and the, and the other big thing is it's no longer garrisonable so you can't shove all your little guys inside which is a little bit of double-edged sword i, I tend to like it as a change just because you're not so incentivized to like, I have my little temple that I have all my guys in and I'm never leaving my house, you know? Um, So I I think that's a good thing. It still has, you know, kind of like the same huge footprint. It's impassable, which means you can do some fun stuff with it in terms of like blocking space on the board. But from an actual rule standpoint, uh, in Coalesced, if you're wholly within 12 of it, it has two benefits. Your bite attacks get a further plus one so they'll be doing mortals on fours, which is which is again impactful. Going from sixes to fours is, is a big deal, um, and then it also lets monsters fight at the top bracket, which is also again super impactful. The only downside to both of those rules is that it's wholly within twelve, 
So it is, it's got a big base. It does kind of have an, a pretty decent size that, that it reaches, but because it's so large, sometimes you're a little restricted on where you can put it and you don't want to put it somewhere where it's just kind of getting in your own way. You know what I mean? So there's kind of this interesting um, balance I found of like, where can I put this thing where it's forward enough that I'm going to get the benefit more often, but it's not sitting in front of my army where I'm going to struggle to walk around this huge pyramid with, you know, a bunch of source who are moving five inches. Right. Um, so th that that's like the one kind of thing I'm, I'm still sort of messing around with a little bit is like, it's, you don't place it like you did the, the old engine. Um, because it, it's, yeah, you want it a little more forward, but it's kind of annoying. So it's like, there, there's a little bit of push and pull there, but overall, I mean, it's, a free buffs from a faction piece that also just existing can provide some complications for movement for your opponent, which is always good. Any, any advice you give me on where you'd place it? Like obviously terrain, battle plan, objectives, all of that comes into play, but are you playing it aggressively as, as close as possible? Are you putting it to the side? Are you putting it as far back? So again, so territory plays plays a huge role in this so if i can i can usually i'm trying to put it as far forward as i can as long as i'm not like i said kind of kind of like blocking off my own movement in a very problematic way if that space isn't available if it's like uh presence of idols for example where it's like you know as far forward is the objective so you can't put it there and if you put it right next to the objective you're kind of sort of screwing yourself a little bit so what i've like i would put it like just back so that the holy 12 are kind of like off to one side the holy 12 is still gonna reach my stuff that's sitting on that center point but it maybe isn't as far forward as i could so i'm trying to position it in a way that its range is going to reach some objectives because that's where my source warriors want to stand but i'm not trying to kind of get in my own, own way um or yeah. if i'm like jaws for example Jaws is one. No, was it Jaws? No, sorry, Prize. Jaws of Galea, Prize. It's Prize. Prize, uh, because of the way the objectives are kind of in that diamond shape, I'm putting it, I am putting it pretty far back in the middle at that point because putting it there gives it that space to touch mm. the to touch the one in your zone. If you can put it to touch two, then then you will. But I, I think that's kind of how you're thinking about it is like where am I going to put this so its buff is on the objectives that my warriors are going to stand on? Because it does make a pretty big difference in in how much damage your bites are going to do. But you just can't you can't let yourself ruin your own movement with it. No, and I think that's that's the the piece, right? Is you don't want to put your terrain piece too because it's a large footprint. You don't want to put it in your way, and because you have, you do uh, not have much speed outside of your monsters. You'll be, you'll be spending a turn or a run roll just trying to get around the stupid mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it, it is it is definitely um, a little bit trickier. It doesn't just kind of sit there and you're just like, ah, mortals, mortals, mortals. Um, but it at least feels more flavorful for Coalesced, which is which is pretty cool. It's it's a nice defensible piece. Um, yep. And I say defensible because you get additional things by being around it. I'll acknowledge the the battalion quickly um so what we'll do now is we'll just go through this um not quickly but like we'll go through some of these but not to be too much detail mm -hmm. then i want to get into the new units um okay. that's something that i really want to get into the war scroll battalion i thought was okay um if you happen to be taking these types of units awesome but I probably wouldn't build a list specifically like a, a battle regiment or a warlord because I want the benefits. Um, where, do, where do you stand on the Thunderquake? I, I think I think you nailed it. Um, if it was a little bit more general, you might see it just like, oh, I, I can happen to fit this in, you know, get a free buff, why not? Um, I think because it is so specific and its buffs, you know, all the battalion buffs are just kind of like one of the generic ones. If it was unified, you might see it more. But because it's just Swifter Slayers, you're kind of like, I, I, I am, you are maybe taking this if you happen to already have exactly that setup. Otherwise, I think it is not even a consideration in your mind. No, no, 
no. Nah, good luck to you remembering Swift or Slayers. Most people, <laughs> most people forget it. Um, in fact, I played today and I forgot my Warlord CP again. Mm. It happens all the time. Oh. I need a to- I need a token. I've got a token for me, my my, uh, my triumph, but I always forget that warlord CP. Yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> what about you, Grand Strat? Where where do you, do you like any of them? Um, and obviously, we're currently in General's Handbook season two, twenty twenty two. We don't know what's coming in the next season, but are any of these ones that you would pick um, for a tournament? So. Um... I, I think Realm Shaper Guardian is potentially good for Starborn, where you can kind of sink it in your zone a little bit more um, and just kind of kind of like protect the Hearthstone, where it's like you can throw this in the corner and, and if someone's got to go way over there to get it, then like, okay. Uh, for for Coalesced, because you're usually being a little bit more aggressive with your Realm Shaper placement, probably not in my consideration pool. Repel Corruption is, you know, defend what's ours. So... That is probably something that you'll see sometimes just because it's an army that does kind of want to sit and wants to to kill the, the units that get within your territory. The biggest problem with Defend the Woods and Repel Corruption is it's that any enemy units. So it's like I Tunnel Master one, you know, Shmo bat into the back corner on my last turn. Well, what do you know? I denied your Grand Strat. That's always mm. a tough pill to swallow. Uh, continuous expansion I liked in the last book. I still like it just because it's one downside is you actually need four units alive, which is sometimes easier said than done. Uh, and then further the great plan is, as I just don't think you ever, you ever take that. So it's like, there's, there's one continuous expansion that I think is okay. I think you're probably still in the GHB grand strategies kind of regardless of what season you're in. Uh, yeah. You're probably looking there first. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with you. I'm not the biggest fan of repel corruption and continuous expansion, and I hate further the great plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've said this on many discussions. I just hate anything that forces you not to choose the best battle tactic and forces you to take no no general sandbox ones. Um, look, if you went really aggressive, maybe realm shaper guardians. Um, that seems achievable, but but you, but you're right. You you have to be smart so that you don't get anyone near it. They don't smash it to rubble. Like it is it is a risky play. But having those block of Saurus warriors um, defending an objective and the realm shaper might not be bad. Yeah, I, I think it's something that you can consider, and, and it and it might very much turn out that like you know the best option is to take that and to to just bury the realm shaper. Don't even worry about its buffs. Just bury it. That's going to get me three points. You know, I'm going to put that in the corner, and at some point, I'm going to get three points from it. Um, but I, I think that is it's something that you could consider. I think yeah, you're probably looking at GHB ones first, and then when you start to to look at Seraphon ones, you're considering realm shaper guardians. Maybe you're considering continuous expansion, and then that's probably it. Yeah, look, in a couple of months' time, we'll have a new General's Handbook, but right now, yeah, I probably would go with um, something generic. Mm-hmm. What about your battle tactics? Without without reading every single one, um, when I when I read them, I thought there was something for everyone, whether you were running monsters, whether you were running skinks, saurus, uh, agridons. Um, if I was going to a tournament in a traditional coalesced list, I might have two to three that I probably can use throughout the game. Um, it's probably unlikely I'm going to ha- be able to use all six because because it's so keyword dependent. Um, as a coalesce player, how do you feel about them? Like, I I agree again. Like, I think you're you're kind of spot on. You're probably never going to have a list that can conceivably get all of these with any kind of reliability. I think there are two maybe three i think there's the the cold-blooded resilience is really good is really good and having i think having one really good tactic is sometimes all you need so i think having cold-blooded resilience like i'm already like cool i'm happy um and then there's a couple other ones that just give you opportunities to be flexible so it's you know uh the one where you can kill something with magic, the one where your monster kills their monster, and then the one where you can hold an objective with nothing but... You have to take an objective with nothing but skinks. All of those are things that give you options, which is which is great, I think. They're all achievable in, in scenarios that aren't totally unlikely to happen. 
and and they give you options and i think the killing the monster goes back to like if you have that kind of assassiny carnosaur that becomes even easier if you have um we'll see in the list I, i'm a big fan of the the hunters of huanchi with the bolas that's a, a a good opportunity to use the the skink one because people push forward their back objective is still theirs but uncontested I drop a, a unit of bolas on it. I take pick that battle tactic. I take the objective and I get my and I get my battle tactic and it's uninteractive, right? Those are just points I'm getting. So mm. uh, that's a I'm a big fan. I, I think that the battle tactics are strong without being, you know, get, get out of the boat, score two points, kill something in the range phase, score two points. <laughs> I think um, the one thing I will say is I think Pack Hunter. I can see people failing because they've overcommitted and uh, not appreciated the damage that the Agrodons can do. So I think totally. I, I can see overkill happening and pack hunters ruining their, uh, it's going to ruin them. Yeah. I, I think pack hunters is one of those tactics where it's like, you read it and you're like, ah, oh, maybe, maybe. And then you take another thing and you're like, actually that's, there's a little bit too much going on there for it to feel like a, a, a safe tactic to, to take most of the time. I feel like if you're going to pack hunter, you got to go into like a monster hero, like because you know that you're probably not going to kill it in one mm -hmm. turn, and you obviously get benefits by being in combat with the rage. But um, if you go into like a screen or something that is it's okay, but not like super durable, yeah, you're going to fail pack hunter because you're going to kill them. Oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Imagine a world where like you're sad for killing a unit. <laughs> All right, let's let's rapid fire through these because we'll be here forever, man. My my video, my, this is the longest preview video I ever I ever did for any book. Like that was and, it's and a lot of units. There's a lot. Well, there's a lot of things that have happened, right? So mm -hmm. let's go through this in like not rapid fire speed, so that we didn't actually get a quality conversation. But like we don't want to go into like the micro details of every war scroll. So let's look at the new war scroll starting at the Croxigore War Spawn. So it's another variant to the Croxigore. Um, it does have some interesting and different rules. Um, heavy skilled uh, scale skin with the minus one to wound against it is quite nice. Blah blah blah. What's your thoughts? Um, I, you know, I think heavy scaled skin is the standout uh, from a kind of war scroll ability perspective. Um, we could talk about how important plus one to wound is minus one to wound just as impactful uh having rend two really nice one of the big criticisms of the last seraphon book was you know there's no rend on anything so having access to rend two is awesome the one model getting the rend two three damage also very very cool um i wish it's spawn of sotek uh rule was a little bit more something it, it feels very very whatever uh but overall i would say it's an awesome, unreally awesome model. Uh, it's got decent ran, which is always something to be happy about. And it's going to have uh, scaly skin and it gets benefits from, you know, Kotal's Claw, Vengeful Defender. So that that's something that I, I really like about uh, Croxigore. The, uh, I will say, like in, in Kotal's Claw, where you get plus one to wound rolls when you charge, an all out attack that is well three attacks each hitting on twos wounding on twos rend two for three damage that's yeah. so and then obviously the mortal wounds in addition um from the the vice like jaws that's a lot yeah that that one guy the the hitting on threes on that one guy with the, th the extra damage is is really cool um i would have liked to see the whole unit hit on threes that would have been awesome but yeah i think you will definitely get the opportunity to uh, with Ren 2, you know, because a lot of that damage is just going to go through on stuff. So you'll come in, you'll have a, a even hitting on threes with all at attack. You're going to have a great roll and you're going to absolutely pick some stuff up with them. Yeah. And the great thing is, even if, if you don't pick it up, you're minus one to be wounded and you're also going to reduce damage by one. So it's pretty good. Like it's a yeah. very good hammer and anvil. Yeah. The, the, Minus one to wound from missile attacks. It, it helps them at oh, least get get across the table. You know, they're they're going to. That's always one of the big considerations of these, like, you know, relatively smaller. You know, it's not twenty wounds. It's not thirty wounds. It's twelve wounds. Three models going across the table. You're concerned, like, oh, does the unit of long strikes just pick that up? You know, without even trying. This helps that happen less. And it's slower, as you called out. It used to be movement eight, now it's movement five. So it is going to take maybe an extra turn that it mm -hmm. wouldn't normally have. 
Unfortunately, this is true. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is true. Overall, it's it's a decent unit. I guess uh, you got so many great options. Um, I think I, I probably agree that it probably goes in Starborn maybe a bit more, but um, I well, I wouldn't write it off completely in a uh, in a Kotal's Claw list. Oh, uh, not at all. And I think that one of the beauty, beautiful things about it in a Kotal's Claw is that they can be battle line. So you could do something like, you know, I can take a, a unit of 20 uh, Source Warriors. That's like my little anvil. And then my options for... Uh, battle line is like, well, Agrodons are 210, Warriors are 200, you know, these kind of slot in uh, just a little bit under the those point, especially when we go to the, the, the regular Croc score is 175, slot in a little bit under, fill those battle line slots, and have a little bit more of a, a kind of a damage presence than, you know, a Source Guard unit might have, or uh, if you're filling it with just Skink Battle Line, Skink Battle Line, or, or something like that. So it does let you have a little bit more punch in those Battle Line roles while still filling kind of some of the necessary slots that you need to fill. Reminds me of playing Trogs in a Gitz Army. Mm -hmm. It's just having those those little mobile hammers, uh, and you could reinforce them. It's a lot of points, um, but it, it takes a lot to lift them. Oh, yeah. A lot. Um. So, so you got yourself some new cavalry uh, and a cavalry leader. So this is the uh, Saurus Scar veteran on Agrodon. Um, you didn't have this hero. Like in the old Lizardman book, you did have like a Saurus on like a baby Carnosaur kind of thing, a cold one. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of returned in its glorious form. Um, so probably we need to recognize that the primal rage um has similar rules to the regular agrodon so you'll need to get familiar with um with this so you build up this rage what are your thoughts what are your thoughts independently just so like if like just just the, the saurus scarvet on car uh, on agrodon and then maybe in addition in combined if i took the agrodon riders so i, I think it unfortunately probably is an option that you're only looking at when you have the riders um i think because so much of his kit i think that alpha roar ability is a lot of the reason why you're taking him that only affects agrodon riders i just don't know if he's as impactful on his own uh to be worth taking you can have an old blood on foot for example if you're just looking for a source general to um have vengeful defender and have you know, Sotic's Gaze or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, an Old Blood on Foot is 40 points cheaper, has one less wound, and has a three up, base three up save. So, like, it, it, I think I think a lot of the benefit you're getting from this guy is the way that he kind of jump starts the Agrodon's damage. Um, and that's probably why I'd end up bringing him. Uh, if he was move 10 or 12, I think you'd consider him a lot more on his own just because he could be a little bit more like that kind of a mini carnosaur piece where he's running around and maybe he's slamming into some some foot heroes and taking them off or providing that like just a little bit of extra shock damage punch um but without that extra move i think he is better replaced on either end like you can have a carnosaur for you know 70 or so extra points or for 40 less you can have an old blood and i think those on their own provide better benefits with agrodons i think he he's awesome i think even if you're only taking like two units of three there's starts to become a very good argument for 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 taking him yeah so so i, I yeah so what i'm hearing is that it's not a mini carnosaur so i mean you obviously could take it folks if you wanted to but um you're really getting the value out of it with um with the synergy to the agrodon lancers mm -hmm. and if you weren't, then you might be better off with either a, a sub-commander or, uh, as you said, finding some extra points somewhere to get yourself a Scar Vet on Carnosaur or a Old Blood on Carnosaur. Yeah, I, I think that's a definitely a fair way of putting it. So what about the Agrodon Lancers? So first off, do you like the War Scroll? I mean, it's a fantastic model, but do you like the War Scroll? F fantastic fantastic model um so i've i've waffled a bit on this war scroll to be honest i think there's there's a lot of things to like i think there's some things i wish it had just from kind of like a biased wish listy kind of kind of point of view um four up save is the the one thing that kind of like stabs me a little bit i really really wish that that he was on a three up save i understand why having a minus one damage fast cavalry model that can pin you early on a three up save would be potentially problematic i i get that i do think that that 
makes him a makes this unit a little bit harder to especially because like i i haven't been using these guys in any of my test games just because the model's not out yet i don't know you can probably guess what base size it is but i don't know so i, I haven't really been trying to kind of guesstimate it but i think so <laughs> so that that was kind of where i was first now i'm a little more like you know what there is an advantage to a unit the, the extra three inches of, of move is not a ton over Soros Warriors, but it does give you just that little bit of extra push for that first turn pressure if if you need to do it. So we'll see in, in one of the lists I sent, like, I think there is an advantage to, like, I'm going to have a big unit of Aggrodons. I'm going to shove that into your face early. Its Primal Rage ability is going to start to trigger. I'm going to use Primal Roar from the, the Scarvet. They're going to be at one. They're going to go in, they're going to have one attack. They're going to stick there because there's nine of them or six of them or whatever. And even though they're on a four-up save, like that's not easy to remove. They're going to stick there. Their damage is going to start going up. You're going to need to pull out, which is, is bad for you because you're retreating backwards probably because I'm in front of you. Or you're going to need to just stay in. You're going to need to get stuck in with my unit that is just getting better and better and better every time that they they are in mm. combat. So I think that there there is potentially a lot of value for that. And I think um, that will be kind of like the secret sauce. I think it'll 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 be: do they stack rage and start to do damage fast enough, or does the four up save prove to be their downfall and they die a little bit too fast to really make primal rage an impactful ability? Um, I, th I think that's where the conversation will be when these guys really start to to hit the table when the model's released. Yeah, I think I, you you raise you raise a really good point, and potentially why I wouldn't run them in the middle of the board. I would probably use them as more like flank mm -hmm. flank pincers and put pressure and and bring them in on the flanks into the middle. And maybe it's where the the um, the Carnosaur, the Saurus, they're my my middle holders of objectives and challenging. And then these guys come in from the flank, kill maybe some of the weaker things. Because you're right the four up save is um, putting a bit of pressure on you and maybe stops you from being as survivable as you want. Like I look at those points, it's 210 points for three models. Um, I, I'm, I'm biased. I'm currently playing Forminators and they're 240 points for two. So that's 12 wounds to your 15 wounds, except I have a three up save. You have a four up save. I do models with a breath attack. That's probably worth the 30 extra points that you're not paying. And yeah, primal rage is cool, but I'm doing damage three on the charge. So, so mm -hmm. I can appreciate where you're at. Um, I think it's a cool war scroll. I think primal rage is going to ultimately prove if it's really, really good, or maybe you're paying too much for a good idea. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's a, a really great way of putting it is, is primal rage is, is going to either be, you're like, holy crap. I'm, I'm stuck in with these guys all the time and they're at, five attacks every swing with their bites and talons because i just can't escape awesome that, then their damage becomes very very efficient otherwise it's like eh, people just retreat and then they die because they're on a four of save then it's like okay well that's a little womp womp you know i think it also makes you think about taking the clubs over the spears because mm -hmm. um if you take the spears yeah you potentially do more damage with the ren minus two but then you're potentially going into the wrong targets and you're not going to leverage primal rage. So, so I think, um, I think you're probably bringing clubs most of the time anyways, just cause unless you're getting a lot of extra attacks in from the spears, the clubs actually, again, like math out, maybe it's not in practice, but like they math out to pretty even on the stuff that it matters and better on the, the crappy stuff. Um, so, I think you're probably taking clubs anyways, but yeah, there's, it, it's a nice option. I think having a model where you could be like, well, this is six attacks on Ren two, like that's cool too. There, there's a lot of armies that, you know, don't want to see a unit coming in with 18, 19 attacks on Ren two, no matter how much damage it's doing. Yeah. Nah, no, thanks. <laughs> um, this is our replacement to the, uh, the razor, the razor Don slash the salamanders, uh, mm -hmm. the spawn of Chotek. Um, I'm just going to straight up say this is so much better on paper than the salamander. Like, yes, there's a little bit difference, um, but I just think overall it's more of a win than a loss than the Sally. Where do you stand? So I think that the salamander was definitely more of just like a pure damage piece. I'm I and, and it was a really a piece that 
once they took scaly skin away from it, you really only saw it in Starborn, where you could, hey, I'm going to drop down nine away from you. I have a 12 inch range. I'm going to do a bunch of mortals. Um, this unit is definitely more of a, a well rounded support piece, I would say. Uh, it's kind of shotgun attack. Uh, is really good, I think. You can clear screens with it. Um, you can kind of trundle it up uh, behind your, your Saurus or your Agadons or whatever and, and potentially like spray spray a screen and, and knock the screen down. Ren 2 on all of its attacks is awesome. Um, you know, there's a lot of high armor stuff. Save stacking is, you know, the bane of Age of Sigmar or whatever. Uh, and then if, if there's, you know, you don't have to do that. There's the option to just kind of like, hey, I'm going to fours suck to hit on. I'm not going to sugarcoat that at all, but I can take pot shots. I'm going to take pot shots at that random hero in the back and potentially kill it. Or I'm going to take a pot shot on this unit my Carnosaur is about, this monster my Carnosaur is about to go into, and then his jaws are rent three instead of, you know, rent two. So, like, there, there is huge value in that. Um, and that's kind of one of the most interesting things about this, I think, is that it's gone from, like, I'm going to just do a lot of damage. It's it's a pure raw damage piece. A ton of that damage was in mortals. To now, it's like it's more flexible. It's you know something that has more options in terms of what it wants to shoot at, what it can shoot at. Um, Twenty four inches of range means it can hang back a little bit more uh, if you want it to. Um, so yeah, I, I would say in the grand scheme of things, it's better in the way that it, it provides you more options. It provides you more flexibility. And I think a, a Salamander in the last book was either like, you're taking it in Starborn because you need damage, or you're playing Coalesced and it doesn't have scaly skin and you're getting your damage from Bastilladon, so it's never in your list. Yeah, you, you, you'll you notice the loss of mortal wounds. Like, you'll, mm -hmm. you're not going to... And, and, but I, I do like the glob of flame acid, the synergy of, like, shooting something, allocate the wound... Um, subtract one from the save roll for that particular unit, and then you hit them the, with the Agridon, you hit them with the Carnosaur, you yep. hit them. It's almost like the Goth is a Harp, not the Harvester, the Catapult, where you you debuff them from range, and then you hit them in the same turn with something and just make the most of that melee attack. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. All right. So we're a, we're a fan. Uh, yeah. You know, I I don't like hitting on fours. I think that there <laughs> that there is space for it in a lot of lists, and I think if there's space for two, you start to have an interesting conversation around like, okay, well, this is a little more reliable now. Am I doing something fun? And they're cheap enough to where like, I think you can probably have, you know, I have 125 points left on my list. Am I going to bring a unit of hunters or a skink unit and have points left over for a triumph? Or am I going to put this in? I'm going to put this in. And it's just, yeah. it's just kind of value. Yeah. Dig it. Um, these probably there's there's similarity between the two raptodons, one being the hunters, one being the chargers. Um, I I'll, I'll let, actually you you shared. So would you run either the hunters or the chargers in a coalesced list? And if you did, why? Um, I personally am not looking at them right now. I, I could see eventually being in a space where I am because. Kind of like when we were talking about Source Knights, like there's value in just uh, five band cav units, uh, the base size and the way coherency works. Like there's value in that. Um, and then I think, you know, hunters have run two shots, again, fours and fours, blue, boo, but whatever. Uh, so having a couple shots is always good. Maybe you can, you know, when GCs go away, you can you can ping off some some low support heroes or something like that. And then from from a chargers perspective, I think if you do look at anything, you're probably looking at chargers just because they are one of the more point efficient damage pieces in the book, even in in coalesced. Um, assuming you're getting the the plus one damage from from hitting someone on an objective. Um, so I think if you're looking at either, you're probably looking at this one, and it's probably because you're getting the benefit of of the cab bases, and also because they can hit pretty hard uh, for. The 150 points that they are so i guess it's like no i'm not necessarily putting them in a coalesced list i think you can and i can definitely see a world where they start to become more frequent in coalesced lists in all lists just because they do seem like one of the just kind of better units in the book yeah uh yeah i i, I just think you have better points to spend in a coalesced list and I, yeah, if, sure. if you if, if you need something fast and mobile and screeny I just dip into my ally pool. I would I would find other things that are not 150 points might be a bit too much for me for five uh, models and a five up save. So I mean they're they're definitely um they're not going to stick around to to take a punch back. No, nah, no. Nah. 
um that that's kind of uh, they're cool models but i think competitively they're probably not a, a, a big choice of mine I agree. um which then leads me to before we get to your lists and we are getting to your lists in a second <laughs> so if you hang you hung on this long i promise it's coming um I, I, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the community has has maybe frustration, disappointment. I don't know. Like there's a lot of emotions. Like there's seven stages of grieving with the engine of the gods. You know, they're going through like <laughs> anger and denial and like all of, all the different things. Right? There's a lot of change here. Your slan, which um, would give them plus one to their dice roll, which wouldn't make a big difference because we've said that, you know, coalesce list may or may not have a slan, so it may not be a benefit. The rules have changed, the way it works, um, the way you do these power dice has changed. Again, without going into all the weeds and the details, where do you stand on the engine of the gods? Is it a good war scroll still? Are people sleeping on it? Um, is it bad? Is it bad because of the rules or the points? Like, where do you stand? Um, I do not think people are sleeping on it. I think it is as bad as, as people think. Unfortunately, I, I love my engine, the gods model. I loved using it. I thought it was, it was a ton of fun, you know, being a priest, being a hero, doing splash more. Like it it was a very fun, very dynamic, very impactful model for that entire book. It is none of those things. Now it is not a hero. It is not a priest. It is uh, not consistent. It's not, there's no way to buff its attacks. So it doesn't have that one turn of like, oh, I'm plus four attacks. I'm going to slam my engine into something and absolutely blow you up. You can't do that anymore. And in my opinion, all that would be fine if its ability was worth using ever. It is so, <laughs> I feel like I'm just like, boo, boo, boo. Its ability is just wildly inconsistent. Um, to the point of almost, I would agree, frustration. So I, I do feel people that do that. The fact that you can, so you can't get some of the better roles without not doing things for several turns. So like to, to summon Soros units, for example, you used to just have to roll a 13 up on the dice before. You could try that twice every turn and you would sometimes just, you know, poop out a lot of Soros Warriors, which maybe you don't need to do that. But now you have to, you get dice by not doing it for a turn and to get to that ability to then summon Saurus, you're not doing things potentially for two maybe even three turns and then there's still a chance for it to fail which and it's not just like a low chance it's like half the time you're failing the role so it's like all right you're not summoning things consistently fine maybe the other abilities are good nope your mortal wound ability is probably the best one on the scroll. But again, it's just like you're doing that maybe twice a game because you have to, to sacrifice the dice to, to power it up. And if you roll bad, then you're doing it once. The heal would be good. And maybe you could just keep it as like, I'm going to throw two dice at this every turn and just kind of heal. But it's wholly within six inches. So it's like you're healing yourself, basically. And it just... That's that's what killed me because, uh, again, me being the Thunder Lizard person I am, I'm like, yeah, cool. I'm going over healing my dudes. But then I realize it's within six inches and your monsters have some big bases. And I'm like, how do I get this? Basically, this would be like following me around like a, my little brother, mm -hmm. just like ch chasing me around the board just to be able to do a, a heal. Like, yep. uh, no. I Exactly. And I if, if, they, if they made that a little bit bigger, I think that you would absolutely be able to see engine. Engine of the Gods would at least have a role. It's the, I'm going to have a, have a pretty decent chance of healing my stuff within 12 every turn. That's worth, that's worth the points debatably. Holy, you know, like, oh, I'm going to have, it's like I have my engine, my monster, my monster, you know, where they're just going to cruise around at this little, like, it's just, it's, it's unfortunately probably a, a completely dead scroll until they, makes it would have to be so cheap to be worth it that it would probably be problematic if the other way because because it because it is a stegodon as well right? right so you can't make it too cheap i i want i wonder because the old engine of the gods used to get an extra dice when there was a slan within range mm -hmm. i wonder if there was a way to get an extra dice on the engine of the gods without just you know reserving your shooting attack if this was a way to bring, because look, when I look at the rules independently, okay, so outside the healing light, which is a very short range, Bolt of Azure energy is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, slow time, really good. Summon Starlight to Thesaurus or Skinks, 
actually really good. It's the it's the how many dice you're going to have and what it's going to take to get those dice that becomes the issue. So if there's a way to get an extra dice somehow, like maybe I don't know, like what, what would it take for you to take this this war scroll outside of just like bringing the points down to the levels of ridiculous? So I think they would they would have to do something to smooth out the pain of using its ability. So whether it's just passively getting more dice or whether it's allowing you to not, because you have to pick one and then roll for it and you either succeed or you fail. So as you get to, you know, time slows on a two to 10, I'm, I'm doing mortal wounds to myself. So if like I get to time slows, all right, I roll a four on three dice. It was a bad roll. If I can then instead do healing light, I, that like that helps that helps a ton it's it's the fact that this model can actually do nothing with its role mm. every single turn you you can fail that role and it's not even like you know we talked about before with uh the slan command tree like a two up you know you're failing that one six of the time that's fine two up two up two up if these all went off on a two up and you roll a one, like, oh, you know, I rolled a one, bummer, or whatever the equivalent is on however many dice, that sucks. The fact that like Starlight summons, you're only doing that on a 13 plus, you have to save your dice every time. So it's like, you're saving three dice to roll, or you're saving two dice, we'll say. You're rolling four dice. You're still failing that a huge chunk of the time. And you also spent two turns not doing anything with it. So it's like, I, I think it's what you said, or it's letting you pick a, pick a lower one for failing the higher ones. It's one of those things to kind of just make that a little less painful. Yeah. Cause like, it's, it, cause the, the average on 2d6 is a seven and average on 3d6 is a 10. Mm -hmm. uh, I think average on 4d6 is a 14. So if you think about that time slows, you need, uh, better than average on three dice. Um, so it, it's an interesting one. Like you initially compare it to like the Magma Droth Breath and like, you know, they they hold it in and it becomes like really powerful. But they've got a guaranteed every second turn, they do a really mm -hmm. powerful attack. There's a trade-off for holding back the, the, the damage. Your trade-off is still a risk and a high risk of failure. So... I, I, I can appreciate where it's at. And I think I think it's not the points. It's the rules interaction and whether it is I an agree. extra dice somehow, whether it is what you said about, you know, well, yeah, I roll a, a seven. I should be able to still do something else. Cool. Okay. I I, I don't hate that idea. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. All right. Let's see if this is something that they change. I assume that no, maybe it'll be in. Um, Fingers maybe crossed. It'll be in, yeah. I, I can appreciate where you're at. Um so you, you to kind of like bring this home, we'll talk about a few lists and then I'll ask you a couple of listener questions that were submitted um, and then okay. we'll go in our merry way. Um, so here's your Thunder Lizard list. It's pretty, um, I wouldn't say it's obvious, but definitely like we're building around a particular style. You've got Lord Croak. You've got the Astralith Bearer, which is using an aspect of the champion in this season. You've got yourself a Skink Oracle on Troglodon. By the way, fueled by Gur Gurish Rage is the um, Astralith Bearer aspect of the champion. Uh, Saurus Old Blood on Carnosaur, who's a general, primal, war beast, and blades of reality. 20 Saurus Warriors with clubs, 5 Saurus Guard, 10 Skinks with the daggers and bucklers, 5 Hunters of Hawachi, and a Bastilladon uh, with the Ark of Sotek wrapped up in a Gal Gal Galician Veteran and a Battle Regiment. So 5 drops, 130 wounds, probably not going to get the Triumph very often what's the how does this work or what's the what's the things we need to know about with this list so when i was building lists i i just i knew right away i wanted to build a thunder lizard list and i wanted to build a codal claw just to kind of kind of show that and when i was thinking about thunder lizard the the things i was thinking about is like okay so you're picking thunder lizard if you don't have the source units for codal's claw so that's already kind of the design space i'm in and then it just kind of so like the you know you start to think like okay like well the the, the archosotech is just kind of a nice efficient monster he finds a spot carnosaurs you know feel good from a general standpoint the troglodon kind of gives you access to uh some some really cool spells and buffs and then that fits kind of very nicely I'm like all right well then then this list starts to work really well with croak because it just kind of becomes these like 
big single defined threats. So kind of the the idea here is is you have the block of warriors to kind of be your anvil. It's gonna what's gonna prevent armies from just pushing into croak and and, and messing you up. Um, and then the combination of the astrolith and the troglodon give you just a ton of flexibility in where you're applying croak's mortals at any given time. So that is what's taking care of your, you know, your your heroes, your buff pieces, your, you know, stuff like that, that, that just straightforward melee damage sometimes has a hard time getting into. And then the combination of the Bastilodon and the Carnosaur, they both give you different damage pieces. The Bastilodon, you know, is, is a little bit tougher. It can sit on a point a little bit harder and it's going to really excel against those, you know, units that want to just kind of come in on off the side that aren't super strong and, and just steal a point from you it's going to kill them with just mortal wounds you know it's going to outfight those units and then the carnosaur gives you that one piece that like you know nothing in this army is is going to really remove a stone horn in one turn uh, uh the old bloodline carnosaur with prime war beast and with blade reality is kind of like we talked about it has that combo to go in and be like this will threaten you. It might not pick that model up. I might whiff my four up jaw attacks, but it is a threatening piece. It is something you have to respect. It has a lot of uh, Ren 2 um, high damage attacks when it's set up in that way. Uh, and then the Hunters just gives you that flexibility to like, on some plans, like you need a first turn tactic and mm -hmm. Desecrate is the only option. Boop, I, I get Desecrate or, you know, an army like pigs or whatever they just want to push into your face oh i'm going to take your home objective it, it gives you it gives you kind of the the teleporting flexibility that starborn has without while well, also maintaining all the buffs that coalesced has so um i i i like this list a lot actually um i as i was building it out i thought it, it does a lot of, like the troglodon i think it's got a great war scroll spell it gives you access to heavenly frenzy uh because this list doesn't necessarily need the the star seer or the star priest as much um i think they're still great pieces but you have the ashworth bearer for the ward so you can kind of get away a little bit with being a little lighter on those foot heroes and yeah it really is just like i have my my core core croak my warriors my my 10 skinks and my hunters can even be a screen if i need to and then i have these these three monsters that all have kind of like a little bit of a defined role that can be positioned and, and, and threaten the things they need to threaten in, in, in an impactful way. And then, you know, of course, Croak, Croak does Croak things. So Croak, he's always good. He's got a lot of spells. He can do a lot of moral wounds. You know, it's always going to keep people honest. So um, I, I think a list like this, where you're, you have one unit of Soros Warriors, it's like, yeah, it gives you that easy, easy Thunder Lizard. The Carnosaur can do the the Roar Titanic Duel. Bastildon can uh, sweep and, and stomp. The troglodon can use its its you know bump its aura up and then also you know uh, roar you or something um, in, in combination with maybe the warriors or something like that um, just to get a little bit more punch through. But I I, I think it, I I like it a lot and I, I think it was something that um, I think Thunder Lizard was kind of like we talked about like it definitely felt a little bit more second fiddle. But this list feels like a list that even though it's not all monsters. It starts to make really good use of the Thunder Lizard buff without sacrificing a, a ton of what you'd get in in Cole's Claw. I think you know just to add just add to what you just said before I get to the Coattails Claw. If you're someone who's a bit more traditional with your Thunder Lizards and say, "Look, I don't want the Slan, I don't want Croak," right? Between Croak and the Saurus Guard, at minimum, you're almost at 500 points that you could reinvest into Stegodons, into another Saurus mm -hmm. Old Blood on Carnosaur. Get yourself some Agridon Lancers. Like, there's 500 points to play around with. Um, you don't want to have your Oracle on Troglodon. Like, cool, you got extra points, right? This is just a basis to where to start. You definitely could go more into the Saurus Warriors. You could definitely go into like some, you know, if you're taking, if you're removing Croak, then maybe you get yourself a Bastilodon with the Solar Engine as well, mm -hmm. just to have some backfield support. Like, there's a lot of flexibility here, but I also appreciate the core, which is the Saurus Old Blood on General with the build out. You got a priest, uh, sorry, you got a, a, a wizard with the um, Troglodon. You got that nice little tanky block with the Saurus Warriors. Um, you got some mobile flexibility with the Hunters of Hawachi and the Bastilodon. 
and then everything else i guess is up to to what you want and how your play style is definitely definitely and and to be honest this list actually started with no slon but i had already built the kotal's claw list which which spoiler alert has no slon so i, I wanted i wanted a list that at least i didn't want both lists to be you know slon list so this one because i had the troglodon in it because i i really like the troglodon's war scroll spell troglodon works really really great with with croak so i was like this feels like a nice a nice spot for croak i actually thought the troglodon uh had an improvement too i thought when i looked oh, yeah. at the war scroll i'm like yeah this is actually quite nice mm -hmm. and which then leads us to the coattails claw so uh Sk skink star priest which is the tides of serpent spell and tunnel master You've got yourself the Skink Star Priest with the Sarsia, sorry, with the uh, Heavenly Frenzy. You've got the, the Saurus Scar Veteran on Agridon, which is a general with Vengeful Defender and Gaze of Sotek. You've got nine Agridon Lancers with Spears, uh, three, three, two units of three Agridon Lancers with Clubs, 20 Saurus Warriors with Clubs, and five Hunters of Hawachi. So... This is a one drop in 1995, 139 wounds. Uh, I like one drop. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I I like this list. As soon as the Agrodon models come out, I think this is going to be kind of like the basis for the list I start to mess around with, uh, depending on how I'm still trying to make Croak work. Uh, but I, I like this a lot just because, like we talked about a little bit, the Skink support heroes, they really are between the abilities they have and the spells they have, they are kind of a little bit more attractive than than um, than the Slon. So having two of them, it lets you, and it kind of gives you these, uh, a nice sort of shape on the battlefield, for, for lack of a better term, because you can, with Vengeful Defender, you're going to be able to push the Lancers up and Heavenly Frenzy, push the Lancers up all buffed up. They're going to have Mystic Shield, they're going to have... Uh, Heavenly Frenzy, so that they can they can run and charge. Um, depending on how worried you are about the clapback, you can pop the the Star Seer's ability early to give them the five up ward until your next hero phase. And then they're also going to have the Star Priest buff for for the the Venom, the sixes to wound do do mortals. So you're going to push nine Lancers in their face uh, early. They're going to hold. They're going to grind. And then you still have. And this is kind of why, like I was talking about, like. Do you run it without a slant? Because what that does is your hero package becomes very tight, very you know convenient, and it gives you so much more points to like do stuff with. So you're pushing nine up there. You popped primal roar, so they're you know four attacks each on the jaws, and then you still have two units of aggro lancers to kind of do the the flanking sort of positioning thing that that you were talking about earlier, and the 20 warriors to kind of be your your home things it gives you a lot of wounds that have scaly skin that have at least decent saves on a lot of pieces on the board and it forces them to deal with something early and if it's an army where you don't have to do that then it's just it's again it's like it's even more wounds with scaly skin on points. I think those two Lancer units could easily be warrior units as well. Um, if you wanted a little bit more of a, a triumph bid, um, that that could be something that is is fun. I think Gaze of Sotek could could easily be Blade of Realities if you wanted to give that uh, Agrodon just like a little bit more a little bit more punch. Um, Tunnel Master could easily be you know Gersh Rage. I think there's a lot of flexibility in kind of how you play with some of those those small pieces. Um, but I think, you know, the, the key parts are the, the Agrodon, Scarbot on Agrodon with Vengeful Defender, and then the combination of the nine Lancer unit that you can pressure early with, and then the 20 Warrior unit that can really, like, sit at home and be that anvil that's going to be very hard to shift. Yeah, I, I I like that you're building into it. And like, is nine too much? I don't know. Like, like probably it could, be, <laughs> like, it, it, it could be some wasted attacks. But I, I like the old idea to like that's 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 that reminds me of like a unit of chosen. That's just mm -hmm. a lot of density, a lot of damage. You could go into almost anything and just grind it down. And the as it gets more attacks with the rage, um, that's a really sc scary threat piece. Um, but it is a big big cloud to move around the board mm -hmm. so definitely um, but uh and obviously like you know if you if you like this kind of build be like man i want a carnosaur in here i'm sure you can tweak it around maybe just run three units of three and put yourself a carnosaur in Absolutely. maybe to be two, be two drops but 
again, I, li- I like your flexibility here, um, giving me giving us some thoughts and some ideas. And obviously, yeah, it is hard to test because these models aren't out yet, but obviously it's a good starting block. Yeah, and I mean, to, to your point, maybe nine maybe nine is too many. Um, I think that you can definitely have the flexibility. That maybe you do want the, the Carnosaur for the, the no inspiring presence. It makes a ton of sense. Um, the the kind of the thought process I had with the nine is that like okay you're on a four up save they get better when they're stuck in you can't make them be on a three up save they're not going to change the war scroll so I can I can just cram more wounds into the unit so you can when you push it up into someone's face like hopefully they they do stick around for a little while but I, I definitely agree it could be three units of three and have more points you could drop the hunters and you could have and then you then you could have points for a slon maybe and and cool. or, or have some flexibility with that. I, t- I tell you what's scary as hell, a rally a rally on that Agrodon Lancer unit. And yeah, you can only bring back two in every time, but that's that's still two yeah. Agrodon Lancers and a really good valuable CP. Um, because you'll likely get one, if not two, every turn as as the unit's kind of degrading. So Yeah, not, definitely. It's not bad. It's not definitely. bad. I think that that's a great point. Well, it's just it's just an idea, but obviously, if you're in combat, you're in combat. If you're not, you're not. Uh, that that was not very insightful. That if you're in combat, <laughs> you're in combat. <laughs> well, I think I think the nice part about this is like you're incentivized to be in combat, so they yeah. don't want to be in combat with you. But then you're also, how do you prevent rally? Well, you got to be in combat. So it's like you can bounce out. I'll lose my attacks, but I'm going to start rallying this unit. If you're in with me, I'm going to get more attacks and I'm going to do more damage to you. So like it it forces an, a decision to your opponent and like that's sometimes a lot of the ways how you win this game is you just like you force your opponent to make a lot of hard decisions and eventually they'll make a mistake and the base is like if you've got a unit of nine you've got uh such a large footprint on the board that you can tag two units Mm -hmm. delete one and still be in combat and generate extra attacks and just move around like that's absolutely not a bad idea absolutely all right, I've, I have some rapid fire questions I'm going to ask you from the community. Okay. So that's, and that's how we're going to, then we'll wrap it up and, and I'll go to bed because it's almost midnight. I need my food <laughs> and sleep. My, my body is a temple. Um, so, um, Archidar, Archidar, um, Archidar has asked, um, are Coalesce superior or inferior to Starborn? um interesting question I, I think both sides of the book have a ton of play i think right now in this ghp in my biased coalesce forward opinion i think coalesce play this ghp's missions more just because there's more kind of like there's less objectives they're kind of more focused in the center or there's like center and then there's a, a couple side ones that people are only holding with like garbage anyways so i per, i personally think on popular opinion maybe that coalesce plays this mission in this GHB better. I think if the next GHB has a, a much larger focus on like, you know, the, the silk steel nests of the world, the six and the eight where stuff is spread apart, that's where Starborn really starts to excel because you can, you know, with the teleports and Drax tail, like and the, the redeploy, like it, it, it starts to really shine. Um, I think in, in those missions. Um, but right now, and I think also like it helps that, you know, KO, slaves, uh, ogres. There's a lot of stuff that I mean gets in and Lumineth is doing a lot of single damage, but there's still there's a ton of stuff that's doing multi-damage as well. So like obviously coalesce plays well into that stuff. I like it. Uh and and biasly on this episode, it's it's coalesced, but yeah. um let, let, let's see how everyone's how everyone lands after the FAQ and what changes, if anything, who knows? Um mm-hmm. Bernhelm asking, um, with Coalesced, how magic heavy would you play? So obviously we've seen some examples here. Um, or are the points better spent fighting with heroes and units? And I guess the answer is both. Um, anything you'd want to add to that? Like we've already kind of discussed this. Yeah, I, th- I think we, you know, we talked about this a-, a while, especially in the beginning, where it's kind of the debate of like, do you slam or do you not slam? I-, I think there's advantages to both. I think that, and that's a nice conversation to have. I think in the past, Seraphon didn't really have that conversation. It was pretty much like you're bringing a slant. So you, the the list starts with a slant, and then you then you add to it. Um, I think there's huge advantages now to not necessarily running a slant, but I will say I think you're always running wizards. I think the Skink wizards are too good to not bring in coalesced unless you are leaning in really heavy on, you know. I guess you're going to want at least one skink wizard for Heavenly Frenzy. So you're going to have a wizard in there for Heavenly Frenzy, whether 
you kind of want wizards or not. So Bommy Turk is asking, um, do you see scaly skin combined with the output of units with scaly skin making coalesced a competitive four one army? Um, so we didn't talk gen a, a lot about how coalesce fits into like the larger competitive and competitive picture. I think scaly skin is, is such a polarizing rule that just having access to it on scrolls that aren't absolute garbage is always going to give you the chance to go for one or better. Um, just because I, I think you can run into matchups that scaly skin is just going to absolutely dumpster on. Um, I think taking a step back in a larger general sense, I think the Seraphon book is, is the perfect book <laughs> because it's in a balanced spot that to me feels right. It's, it, the problem with Seraphon in the competitive sense is the books, the last like six or seven books that have come out before it, not Seraphon. So I, I don't know if the combination of scaly skin and damage is going to be enough to make it go 4 1, 5 0 consistently in a world that exists with, you know, Beats of Chaos and Gits and Lumineth and Corn and Slanesh and Soulblight and OBR the way they exist right now. I, I just don't know if you have a good enough matchup into most of those lists on enough occasions for it to consistently be like, yeah, this is going to be a book that's going to be in that 4-1 space all the time. I don't know if you can say that now. I think you will be able to say that sooner rather than later, because I think all of those books are probably going to get adjusted in some way, shape or form over the next year or so through the various balance updates. Yeah, I think we I think we need to remember that we are sitting in a world where a bunch of those books have not been errated or FAQ'd and clarified, and there are some things at risk. Um, there is also remembering that in like probably two months' time, there'll be a new general's handbook, and who knows what the incentives are going to be and the battle plans and the structure and and all. So I, I, I think at, I think you are definitely in the 3-2 space and a good player who can pilot and build a list and and make the right decisions and practices could, could definitely go 4-1. But definitely. they're not going to be the type of army that you just put on the table and you automatically win. It is going to take some time. It can take some practice. Um, like when I look at your list, it is light on bodies, um, mm -hmm. but with good gameplay, you can absolutely make the most of it. So um, three, two with four, one and five and O oh, because you are a good player, not because of the list. I, I, I would agree completely. It's, it doesn't have, uh, I think to use an easy example, it doesn't have that KO potential of like, I'm just going to exist and occasionally I'm going to blow you off the table and, and win this game. I'm, I'm, I'm not gits with all my squigs. And... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It, it, it is, it is not, um, it's not a book or you're not going to make a bunch of lists where it's like, oh, wow, those war scrolls are just blowing me away. The amount of damage this army is doing is just blowing me away. I can't possibly see how I win against this. I don't think there's going to be a lot of games like that. Um, I do think occasionally you'll run into coalesce lists and you'll be like, wow, I expected to kill something. And instead I've been stuck in combat with Agrodons or Saurus Warriors for three turns and I don't know what's going on anymore. It reminds me a little bit of OBR, just this constant grind. Mm -hmm. um, what, while we're talking about this, um, Tyrion Ada has said, um, how do those matchups look like with the top meta picks? Like, and obviously, you know, KO, Lumineth, the Corn, Bok. Uh, I, I mean, obviously that that in itself is probably a whole hour discussion and, and they, obviously they all act very differently. But do you think you have the tools to compete with some of these um, top meta picks at the moment? Um I think that you have the tools to compete. I think against a lot of those opponents, it will be a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, I think scaly skin is going to go a long way. I think that's why I, a lot of the time I lean on like maybe just more bodies is the appropriate answer, just because you know you play to your strengths. The army's hard to kill. It grinds well. Play to your strengths. Take more bodies. Grind harder. Um, I think it sits on points really well, which is how you win the game. So that that's always good. Uh, I do think a lot of those those armies have. You know, it has murder lust, which is just you're obviously you're like holy sh like crap. That is an ability that is just defining this book in a way that is, you know, very impactful. You can do a lot. It's very active. You can do a lot of cool things with it. Um, OBR has too many things to talk about of, of how good it is, but I do actually think Seraphon has a decent matchup in OBR. Um, and then yeah, like things like 
Lumineth and Gets where they're just doing a lot of a lot of damage one. That might be a struggle uh, a little bit. Um, I don't know how uh, Gets especially without Horrorgast um, feels like not a great matchup for for Coalesce just because you know whether it's maybe in the Trogs, but like if it's your traditional Gets list, squ you know Squigs are doing a lot of, a lot of a lot of attacks and a lot of mortals, and and you're not really getting around that. Um, I think that the army has the tools. It has a lot of scrolls. It has a lot of things in the book. I think you will have the tools where where good players will be able to get squeeze a lot out of this fruit, for lack of a better term. Like, yeah, I think for me, when I look at it, right when when we look at those top meta choices, some of them will be better handled with Starborn. Some of them will be better better handled with Coalesced. I, th I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, and again, yeah. with such a deep book, it's hard to say depending on what you're building around. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Bobby Tan asking, and I, I, we've already touched on this a little bit, um, is the Slan or Croak necessary for a Coalesce list? Uh, no, um, it doesn't have to be. Um, but what I wanted you to acknowledge is, is Croak's cost so cheap at the moment that he feels to be an auto-include? Now, you did include a Croak. I did, I did, and right now the list I'm kind of messing around with, uh, from like you know what is my competitive list going to be? They I have tested only lists with Croak in them currently in Coalesce. Uh, I will say in those tests I have not been so blown away with Croak's ability that I felt like oh I can't possibly remove him from the list. That is not the way I felt at all. Uh, I have kept him in there just because it does seem a little bit like what he provides at 400 points is very, very strong. And there, it, it comes back to like the, it's polarizing because corn, you know, blades of corn is problem. Like you're doing no mortals. You're just, you're, he, he is just a, a 400 point buff piece. And a lot of the time you're also bringing the astral affair. You're also bringing guard. And that combination of stuff means maybe you didn't have enough points for a carnosaur. Maybe you didn't have enough points for that, you know, second skink wizard that you wanted to bring. So there, there's, a, there's a drawback there. And I feel like you feel that drawback in the matchups where Croak can't get away with doing a ton of his mortals at range. I think that if he goes up even close to what he was in the last book, you'll never see him in Coalesce. I think if, if he's if he's 450, I don't know if you ever bring him in Coalesce. I think if he's 415, you think about it. I think at 395, you think a lot about it. But even then, I don't know if it's... It's so hard. Like, Nuance is dead, right? Like, he, he is not a must-bring, in my opinion. No, I don't think so. And I'm saying no to you because um, now that he's gone down under 400... I am considering Croak as an ally to Stormcast. Before he was too expensive. Mm -hmm. Now it's it's actually like stroke the beard time. Like if we go into a magical dominated air, a meta, this guy might save my backside because Stormcast is not that good in magic, and I will just get my butt kicked. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely a option. Don't go up any higher, please, please, <laughs> please. Um, a couple of final questions from Drew BT. Um, dropping, dropping all the questions. So thanks, shout out, Drew. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you the first part. It's like, what are the maths on two spawns of Chotek and the old blood on Carnosaur giving double all out attack in the shooting phase? You go and do the maths, Hammer Mate. But the question I want to ask, and obviously it's it's decent, but the question is, um, are they worth it for that alone? Or are they too expensive um, for the little things they bring to the table? Um, so I will. I'll, I'll shout. There's a ton, ton of good math hammer sites out there to to do all that stuff. And I I spent a lot of the time just like putting in in things to kind of get a sense of how much damage stuff does. Uh, I personally have not had uh, spawn up Chotex in any of the lists I've tried. I've had a lot of great conversations with, especially people in your Discord. Uh, you know, Tavi is, is was talking about you know kind of uh, the praises of, of having two of them. I can definitely see there being advantage advantages. I don't know if you are just bringing it for the potential at the minus one save, because I actually like its shock on attack, it, its twelve inch attack better. I think four ups. So so to have the the old blood and two spawns and give both of them all out attack, the math is probably decent ish. 
but you still have to get damage all the way through. And like you're investing a lot to then potentially get one extra rend on one unit. Um, is that worth it? I would say probably not. But having them in your list, the total package of them, I think has a very good chance of being worth it. And I don't think bringing them is ever going to feel like wasted points unless you're bringing one and you're relying on him solely to add that extra rend. I, I think that will disappoint you because you won't get that as often yeah i, I would agree uh for 125 points you, you can put two in for 250 mm -hmm. and i think it gives you reliability and if, if your first attack does the uh the damage cool you just target somewhere else if not you've got a backup so i would yeah i would agree with you on that um and i probably wouldn't take a unit specifically to do all that attack because if you look at the maths and if you look at um Oh, it's not the law of diminishing returns. When you look at like the curve to see like the percentage benefit between like a five to a four, four to a three, three to a two, two to a one, well, not the one, but uh, you notice that the value actually decreases um, as you kind of you know, become more consistent. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, on that alone, I'd, I'd probably just test two uh, Chotec uh, spawns first without it and see if it's enough. I mean, and, and the old blood on Carnosaur is good. So if that's in your list, if you have two spawns in your list and you do that, awesome. You have a little bit of better chance of getting sure. that minus one ran. But I don't think that's a combo you're building into lists for that reason. No, it's it's not it's not Zinch. So sorry, it's right. not um it's not Slanesh doing three uh all out attacks right. uh, on the kill from onto like your Blissbar Barches. Right, right. Um two more questions from um from Drew. Uh, people are complaining that Agridons don't do enough damage in melee, but they also complain that the BT, the battle tactic we just talked about, um, about them being stuck in combat. Do you think people are missing something? Um, uh, I don't think people are missing something. I, I think a lot of conversations just tend to be very polarized. Uh, I think I'm like mentioned very nuance is, is kind of sometimes dead. I think Agridons are a war scroll that doesn't scream out i'm really good put me in every list I, I just don't think it does that you put the you math hammer the damage it does until it starts stacking rage it's very you know decent good it's like the the theme of this book it's good damage it's going to be good but um i think the problem with the battle tactic is not that like oh people complain it doesn't do damage but then you have a battle tactic where you don't want to kill stuff so shouldn't that be a good thing the battle tactic just takes too much stuff to go off right to to be reliable it is the problem with the battle tactic they could do way more or way less damage and that battle tactic would still be garbage because it's just hard to get all those pieces working in a way where you can always say like you don't want to drop battle tactics you can't so like there's you know risk built into that battle tactic already and then there's, you know, on top of there just being general risk of co completing any battle tactic. Yeah, I think I think you could start off by saying it's costing you 420 points to do that battle tactic. Right. Like, and that's, and that's that, if it, it works, you know. That's even before the setup, right? So I think you've got to think, uh, am I taking the the Agrodon Lancers purely for the battle tactic? No. Um I think the damage output, depending again, are we talking spears? Are we talking clubs? Obviously, clubs do more damage when during the grind, but lances do more damage on the charge. So maybe you go in with the clubs first, then you go in with with the um, the lances second, or you or it's all about your target priority. So who you charge mm -hmm. into, make sure that you're setting yourself up for for that particular battle tactic. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a battle tactic that it, if you have to pick it. You're you're in a you're in a rough spot, and you're just kind of fingers crossed that it goes off either way. Yeah. Uh, last question, and then we'll bring it home. Is do you think Emerald Life Swarm could be used for a Saurus and Agrodon list? Interesting so, question. Uh, so the problem with Life Swarm with Warriors specifically is like it has a weird interaction with two wound models, right? Where it's like you're either healing one wound or you got to roll a two up to bring a guy back. So for that reason, I, I don't think you'll you'll see it very often and i think in general once they took away the like the double heal on the turn it comes out emerald life swarm has been just a little rough from from uh kind of an, any way you look at it i think if, if you have points for a uh, an endless spell you're looking at other ones before you even get to emerald life swarm 
Agreed. Without the double tap, I've dropped it from all of my lists because it went up in points and it yep. lost the double tap. And no, I'd rather some more offensive power like gnashing jaws. I'd prefer, mm -hmm. as you said, horror ghast, or I'd rather something that'll help me in my game um, and healing maybe one wound because as you said heal. No, I don't, I don't need that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Basil, is there anything you thought I want to wrap it up or any anything you want to say, like any shout-outs, any people you want to call out? This has been awesome, by the way, almost three hours of incredible value. Um, I've tried to keep it sharp, but there's just so much to talk about, and you yeah. know, we could talk we could talk for days. So um, I appreciate all of the wisdom, and I hope this has been helpful for people to like unpack Seraphon and think about this at a very coalesced level. But um if people want to talk to you, where can they find you? Who do you want to shout out? Let's uh, let's give the mic to yourself. Uh, cool. I I wanted to give the th give the thanks right right back. It's been it's been a pleasure, man. I, I love talking, Seraphon. I hope also that it, that it was it was helpful for people. Um, I am not Ridge, but I you know I try. I, I do I do want to shout out Ridge. Ridge Ridge and I uh, talk a lot. Um, you know, shout out tough crowd. Uh, we, we talk a lot about Seraphon lists and, you know, he's, he's been a big help as we've been kind of coalescing what lists we want to, we want to use. Um, and he's very much more of a starborn guy. So it's, it's kind of nice that, that we have that, uh, yeah, man. Um, if, if people want to reach me, I'm, I'm in, I'm in your discord. Uh, it's putz frow and some some numbers i don't remember i think right now my name in your your discord is like <laughs> slan cheeks aficionado or something uh post in in any in any chat and and i i'm sure i will find it eventually because somehow i i continue to find myself you know just trolling discord on a regular basis but uh yeah man it, it's been it's been awesome i'm always down to talk seraphon if anyone has you know any questions anything i i will chat about this endlessly um and, and I am, you, I'm always you, open to it. Are you on Twitter? Like if you get some, get oh, some I, am, I am. I am on Twitter. Um, it's at blue B L U bars, B A R Z. I will try to remember this in the morning and uh, <laughs> add it, add it to the video description. So awesome. Uh, go get some extra followers. You deserve it. And um, yeah, come, to, come to the discord. Uh, obviously you've got a, a great Seraphon chat, people trying to work it all out and mm -hmm. very, very supportive. But um, Basil, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. Um, if people enjoyed it, please go follow him on Twitter. Um, come and join the Discord if you want to talk more Seraphon. Uh, and also, as always, leave comments in the comment section. I know, again, in three hours, you think we can get everything, but guess what? We didn't. Um, so if there's any combinations or you think that, you know, certain things work or maybe you are a pro engine of the gods person and there's something that I'm missing and we're all missing, let us know. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to see. I'm sure there is something in it um but right now like let us know let us know we're all learning right we're all learning we're all trying to figure it all out so let us know in the comments all right awesome. bedtime for anthony he's an old man and it's almost midnight <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks everybody Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.